Full court pressure now, token. Man-to-man -man pressure by New Mexico. Easily handled by Wheat. We are under two minutes to play in the game. Louisville's got the ball in a three-point lead. A spot in the Sweet 16 at stake. Pick down for Wheat. Johnson nearly traveled on the catch. Here's Wheat. They get it to Dantzler. Dantzler dipping the shoulder out to Smith. Deep to Wheat. Eight on the shot clock. Wheat has to give it up. Johnson off the side of the glass. Shield to a hand. Smith, he's got long. He takes it himself. He'll get to the line. Great play, defensive play, smart play by Dewan Wheat. All Charles Smith has to do is throw just a little bit of a lob, and they have an easy dunk. Dewan Wheat makes the grab right here. Smith's teammate is next to him for the easy layup if he gives it to him earlier. Third personal foul for Dewan Wheat. Alvin Sims is going to come back in. Charles Smith with 14 points at the free throw line. Makes the first. One, shot, one, shot. one minute, 19 seconds to go in a two-point game here in Pittsburgh. Smith makes them both. He's got 16. And we've got a timeout called by the Lobos of New Mexico. Don't go away. It's a one-point game. Seventy-nine seconds to play here in Pittsburgh. All fouls will be two-shot fouls. Louisville with two timeouts. New Mexico one. And the Cardinals have the arrow. New Mexico defensively has taken away a lot of options for Louisville on the offensive end. Not allowing good shots. Last four possessions. Louisville struggled. The clock has run down on them. They have forced up some bad looks. Johnson, the freshman, will inbound. He gets it right back, looking to put the ball in the hands of Dewan Wheat, and he does. Good double team by New Mexico. Makes someone else handle the basketball besides Dewan Wheat. Good job by the senior, though, of coming back and getting the ball. Louisville can take it under a minute. Oh, Dewan Wheat, so a great block, but the ball is there. Sanders the basket. Terrific set play in a half-court set by Denny Crum out of the timeout. It is still a one-possession game, though, and the Lobos have the ball down three. Long. Smith wanted it sooner in the corner. Gibson over the top to Santiago. He gets the bucket, and he gets the bucket. Oh, what a hoop by big Santiago. I thought he was going to get a foul, too. 64-63. Three-second difference between the shot clock and the game clock. Louisville with their free throw shooters handling the ball. Flynn and Wheat. And the timeout is called by Dewan Wheat. Good trap by Gibson and Long. Right out in that little triangle in half court that you don't want to get caught in. Louisville by one. I want to take a look at Dewan Wheat as he turns the corner. Received a ball pick screen by Sanders. The great block from Charles Smith coming weak side, but Sanders on the follow-up continued to go to the basket. The reaction, it is March Madness. On the other end, they're down three. They go inside to Santiago. Maybe not the option Louisville was thinking about. Good bucket, got bumped, almost drew another foul. Johnson gets it into Wheat's hand. Lobos want a trap. Skip pass to Sims. Back out to Flynn. May have to give the foul here. Traveling violation. Lobos get the ball down one with 16 seconds to go. New Mexico continued to trap the ball. Flynn could not get rid of it. Was caught in the half-court line. Nowhere to go. We've got a timeout. 16 on the clock. New Mexico will have it when we get back. 16 seconds to go. New Mexico cannot stop the clock. It'll be Louisville ball on any kind of tied up possession. Smith will inbound directly in front of us. Gets it to Gibson. Wheat long. there defensively. Long is very good off the dribble with his penetration. Here's Long. They get it in the hands of Smith. Smith back out. Gibson. Gibson. A floater. No. Rebound. Flynn. Time's going to run out. It does. Louisville wins. What a defensive stop by the Cardinals. Denny 
Crum thought there was time left on the clock, wanted his players off the floor, but this game is over. Now he can celebrate. A heartbreaking loss for Dave Blitz and his New Mexico Lobos. And Denny Crum now 13 and 5 in the second game of NCAA tournament will take his club to the sweet 16. Second, second half explosion by Louisville out of the locker room. They did a nice job defensively, offensively put it in the hands of their star, Dewan Weed, who had 22, and then they held on. They couldn't score much in the last three minutes and 53 seconds, only two points since Kenny Thomas fouled out, but they hung on, terrific on the defensive end, very unselfish ball club. One of the reasons why this team advances. And Louisville is on their way to Syracuse. 17 Sweet 16 appearances for the Louisville Cardinals. Let's take it back to Pat O'Brien in New York. Two games completed. Let's go right to Kansas City. Now Kemper Arena where Clemson leads Tulsa 58 to 55. A physical game. Let's go courtside with Ted Robinson, Derek Dickey. Cold. Four-point game. Ball knocked away. Saved by Tulsa. Gendron. Seals. Strip going up. And finally a whistle and a foul on Clemson. Maldonado's down underneath the basket. Gendron had a chance to go in for a layup. Instead, he steps behind the three-point line. And as the shot goes up, take a look at Maldonado, and he gets hit, it looks like, by his own player. Shea Seals might have gotten him with a right, a left elbow. Look at Maldonado, number 50, underneath the basket. As he's going for this loose ball, he's going to catch a left hand by his teammate. In Kansas City, Clemson by four. 36.9 seconds remaining. Tom Whiteman of Clemson has just fouled out of the ballgame after an 11 rebound performance. Michael Ruffin of Tulsa eventually is going to be at the foul line, but we have still Maldonado of Tulsa down beyond the baseline. And if you haven't seen much of this game, this really is the story. It has been an unbelievably physical battle several players getting the worst of it today. Look underneath. Watch Shea Seals as he gets the ball stripped out of his hand. His left hand catches Maldonado. It appears somewhere in the eye area. Maldonado had to leave the game earlier after getting elbowed in the chest. Terrell McIntyre of Clemson was cut for four stitches over his left eye in the first half. So it has been just a little physical down inside. This is the first game of the day in Kansas City. The winner goes to San Antonio next week. And coming up next here, the number one seed, the Golden Gophers of Minnesota. A legion of thousands of Minnesotans have made the way to Kansas City. And they'll watch the Gophers play Temple coming up next. Iowa State and UCLA have already made it to the Midwest Regionals in San Antonio next weekend. That's a huge win by Iowa State yesterday, upsetting Cincinnati. And UCLA has played great basketball the last month. Yes, they have, and a lot of people don't give them credit for their defense. They're a very superior offensive team, but defensively they've done a great job. Well, here's where Tulsa has been hurt today. They are 13 for 27 at the line. Wow, that's less than 50%. And if they had made free throws, they could have had control of this game. And Michael Ruffin misses both. And now Clemson in command. McIntyre. Christie. And a hell ball arrow to Clemson. And that was really not a good play by Terrell McIntyre. No, it wasn't actually a very dangerous play trying to make a high lob pass into traffic. Why would you risk that? You don't need to take a shot. All you need to do is get the ball in your front court. Well, McIntyre made up for the mistake by coming in and tying up the ball, getting possession back. Now Buckner is fouled with 26 seconds to play. And Rick Barnes immediately <laughs> calls McIntyre over to the bench to ask him about that lob. <laughs> what were you thinking about? Guys, we don't have to score. All we need to do is run time off the clock. 
That's what we have to have. We need the win. We don't need more points or fancy plays in this ballgame. Ellie. Third player has fouled out of the game now. It is Tulsa's Zach Bennett. Harold Jamison coming back in for Clemson. Bennett, redshirt freshman, nine points today. Nice lift off the Tulsa bench. Greg Buckner, second team all ACC this year against Miami in the first round. He had 22 points and nine rebounds in that ball game. Well, there is a big story. Clemson has been the team that, as of late, has been struggling terribly at the line. But today, Tulsa left a lot of points there. We always talk about guys. We talk about teams that are money players. And Clemson has stepped up big. Even though they didn't shoot a great field goal percentage today, they were the aggressor. They initiated the action. They got to the free throw line, and they made enough to get control of this game. And now a six-point lead. Jay Seals bringing it up. He has scored only one point today. Well, Clemson will give him that four-point lead, though. Still a two-possession game with a Tulsa timeout. 19 seconds remaining. It is Clemson by four in Kansas City. Genuine Chevrolet players of the game are Johnny Gendron from Tulsa with 15 points and Terrell McIntyre of Clemson with 14. Clemson to win down the ball. Leading by four, Eterbe gets it in and McIntyre is fouled right away. And that will be the fifth foul against Johnny Gendron. Well, it's already a two possession game as far as the Golden Hurricane are concerned. And Clemson gets a chance to extend this lead with two more free throw attempts, but uh, I, I really want to credit Rick Barnes and his staff. They've done a terrific job. We saw them in the first round shut down Devin Davis from Miami University, not allow him to become a factor in the game. And today, Shea Seals, they allowed him only three points in this game, just receiving his first field goal a few seconds ago. A nice game for Gendron, a sophomore. John Cornwell getting instructions as he'll come in from Steve Robinson. But I think really you look at one team being able to exert its will on another team, Derek, and Clemson's opponents only score 60 points a game. Tulsa has been averaging closer to between 80 and 90, and the game's going to end up being the Clemson score. And you talked about this earlier, Ted, that Clemson wanted to keep the score low. They wanted to maintain possessions, try to take advantage. The game was ugly early in terms of both teams missing a lot of shots, but Rick Barnes' philosophy was, guys, be patient, get to the free throw line. We know we're going to be fouled. We just have to concentrate and make the majority. And the Tigers having a great day at the foul line. Adrian Crawford. And a tip in for Tulsa. And a timeout taken by the Golden Hurricane. All they have left is a 20, so that's what this will be. In a four-point game. Shea Seals able to sneak in and get another field goal to his credit, but uh, it certainly is a little bit too late. But he's only getting it as a result of the, the help and shelter, and no one guarding him knows on nose. Something to look at, Derek, if indeed this happens now, is Clemson in good shape here. If it is indeed Clemson and Minnesota in San Antonio, they played in Puerto Rico in the tournament back in November, played a very competitive game. Minnesota won 75-65. And that was a neutral court. Neither team had a home court advantage. Adrian Crawford fouling Merle Code to Clemson. Minnesota has to get by a very tenacious matchup zone defense by John Taney. And if somehow that were to happen, if Temple could pull off the upset today, Clemson's going to have a little insider knowledge uh, against a, in a potential Temple game. Johnny Miller, after two years of playing for John Chaney at Temple, transferred as a member of the Clemson program this year. Well, he's going to be able to help figure that matchup zone out. Uh, you and I saw him two years ago as a player. He is a terrific scorer and an excellent outside shooter. Adrian Crawford missing, and then a foul over the back on Ruffin. 
And now they celebrate on the Clemson bench. Rick Barnes came to Kansas City never having won a game in the NCAA tournament. He'll leave with two. And Clemson's going to gas up their plane here and go right to San Antonio. That's Rick Barnes' first Sweet 16 appearance, and he should be awfully proud of his team. Only two seniors on this ball club. They returned all five starters from last year, and that's not even counting Merrill Cote, who was unable to play in last season's postseason. Clemson made the Sweet 16 in 1990, the last time that happened. And now the Tulsa side giving a great ovation to Shea Seals, who leaves the court for the last time in a Tulsa uniform. A very difficult day today. Just three points hampered by fouls early. Has a chance to uh, continue his play. But Tulsa's all-time leading scorer. Five points total today for Shea Seals. But Rick Barnes now has his chance to celebrate, and the Clemson Tigers are going to San Antonio. They are the third team to advance out of the Midwest region. Terrell McIntyre with a terrific second half, ending up with 16 points. And Clemson wins it 65-59 here in Kansas City. And next up, the number one seed, Minnesota. They'll play Temple and John Chaney's great matchup zone. So Clemson advances here in Kansas City. And now let's go back to New York and Pat O'Brien. All right, Ted, Clemson's first Sweet 16 trip in seven years, so the celebrating will commence. Let's go back to Charlotte now, where Illinois trails by a point against Chattanooga in a back-and-forth game. 5-16 left in this ball game at Charlotte Coliseum. And they've got a time out there, and Clark, this has been a back-and-forth game all day long. We anticipated this would be a close matchup. Again, these teams match up evenly, like they're doing on the perimeter. Tennessee Chattanooga has a guy, Johnny Taylor, who could be a mid-level first-round pick. Very versatile guy. Their backcourt guys, Willie Young in foul trouble. Kiwan Garris has to step up big for Illinois. Okay, it's the only active game right now, so let's send you out there. 5-18 left in the half. Tennessee Chattanooga, 15th seed, trying to do something no other Southern Conference school has ever done, and that is make it to the round of 16 in the NCAA tournament. Illinois out of the big Genesis seed, and Turner turns it over. And Tennessee Chattanooga only able to force seven turnovers today, but they have managed to get the Illinois front line in foul difficulty. Gandy and G both on the floor now for Illinois, playing the four foul. Johnson leads the game, and Kevin Turner sits down. Poor defensive recognition by Mike Hellman. UT Chattanooga was in a box in one then, and, they, and Hellman did not recognize it and get his team in the appropriate offense. And starting the half, five for six from the floor, the Illini have gone two for 13 and three minutes without scoring. Tennessee Chattanooga by one. Pick and roll, defended well by Illinois. Taylor, crossover. Ten in the game for Johnny Taylor. Senior star from Chattanooga, Tennessee, not recruited out of high school, went to junior college, grew four inches in one year, and has elevated his level of play. Young, creating habit for Garris, but Keywon able to recover. Once again, Illinois has failed to recognize that UT Chattanooga is in a boxing one defense. Mims has a dozen rebounds today. It'll be interesting to see how long it'll take the Illinois players to recognize what defense UT Chattanooga is in. They're playing man-to-man -man on Kiwan Garris and a four-man matchup zone. Young gets pushed near the end line. Garris now has four. So Young with four, Garris with four. That's a standoff along the perimeter. And on the low post, both G and Gandy playing with 4-5. 3.35 remaining. Providence already a winner today over Duke. And they await the winner of this game in Birmingham in the Sweet 16. 
Young, the senior from Norfolk. Great work from practice against the likes of Alan Iverson. The biggest of names, Young making a name. And we will be back. We're looking at the story for 14 seeds through 16 seeds. They've had some first round wins. No 16 has ever done it. The last to go through to the Sweet 16, Kevin Mackey's team, Cleveland State, ultimately losing to Navy. If you're wondering about the lowest seed to ever make it to a Final Four, Dale Brown's LSU Tigers that very same year in 1986 in Dallas. For our viewers, let me explain what I mean and what constitutes a box and one defense. One defender for UT Chattanooga plays Kiwan Garris man-to-man, -man, and the four remaining players play a, a, a four-man zone. Turner for three. Taylor runs it down. This is the largest lead for Tennessee Chattanooga, equaling that mark at 8-3 very early in the game. So a hoop here would be very big. Under three minutes to play. And a steal by no Turner. Johnny Taylor became a little careless with the basketball. Good offensive players always keep their body between the basketball and the defensive player. That time, Johnny Taylor exposed the basketball. UT Chattanooga, 2-1-2 two -two zone. Mac McCarthy earning his stripes today with a changing defense. Another error in the open floor. Young specialty to Turner. They may be singing, pardon me, boys, is that the Chattanooga choo-choo headed to the Sweet 16? <laughs> Illinois not scoring a field goal in the last seven and a half minutes. They'll have to come up with something right here. Pressure defense, when applied correctly, can force the ball handler into poor body position. Here we watch Keelon Garris as he loses balance in an attempt to regain a good offensive position. The size of Taylor, really the difference there. And Mac McCarthy told us he would float some bigger people on Keelon, and that time it was the difference in that turnover. Well, and not only uh, has the size become a factor in defending Keelon Garris, but the rotation of players has started to wear him down. Eight-minute drought from the floor for Illinois. They must solve it here. And he's trying to keep it alive. Loose ball to Connor. As UT Chattanooga out to give their coach a win that would tie him in becoming the winningest coach in the history of the Southern Conference and would mark a place in history for the league itself as being the first ever entry into the Sweet 16 by a Southern Conference team. Illinois choosing not to foul. Shot clock winding down. Young, this is his time. Over the back as he tried to keep it alive, and that's his fifth. So Willie Young... Fouls out with 117 remaining. You see the timeout story. You see Chattanooga with a 20, two fulls. Ron Kruger can stop it a couple of times. Young leaves the game with 15 points and three assists. And Johnny Taylor, the first to come over and give him a hug. It was Taylor, you'll recall, that was on the bench the last two minutes of the win over Georgia. And it was Young that had to make the plays to ensure a second round opportunity for the Mocs. Be just the opposite today. But you really can't say enough about the complimentary players, particularly Chris Mims, the senior from Union Springs, Alabama, number 34 in blue, has been a real difference. If there was ever a moment in UT basketball history and in the basketball life of Chris Mims when he had to play to his maximum ability level, it was today. Suddenly the iron unkind 
at the free throw line to a young man that shoots at an 80% clip. Heldman gets one of the two, 66-60. Steal by G. Stolen back by Chattanooga. And on the double team, a push. That'll be Gandy's fifth. To all those people who, on a yearly basis, like to suggest that these low Division I teams should not have an entrance into the NCAA tournament. We're looking at every reason why they should when we view the outstanding performance by this UT Chattanooga basketball team and an outstanding coaching job by Mac McCarthy. We mentioned it earlier, tutored under Sonny Smith as an assistant coach. Had an opportunity to get the Auburn job when Cliff Ellis came over from Clemson. He's been there a dozen years, and he's very high on the opportunities and the program that exists, but this is an opportunity for the rest of college basketball to understand that UT Chattanooga is on the map and has quality talent. Tim, a win like this for UT Chattanooga is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it's a great moment for the program. But the curse part is every AD in the country with a vacant job open is going to come after Mac McCarthy. Touch of the times of 1997. Notary picking up the foul against Johnny Taylor. What a way to tan, tie the all-time conference record for wins in the most important game in the history of the institution. Trying to make it in to the round of, of 16 in Birmingham, Alabama. 46.6 remaining. Young now can rest easy as Johnny Taylor takes care of more business. Taylor's moved now into ninth place in the all-time Tennessee Chattanooga scoring list. 1,048 points. Turner off the dribble. And the drought continues for Illinois from the floor. Not scoring a field goal in the last eight minutes. And this is a win that will find a place of permanence in UT's bank of basketball memories, Tim. Notre has his fifth, and the celebration is on. And that senior's played his final game. That's a difficult thing for any young man to go through. The moment is Max for the Mox. No three forced to leave. He'll have another year. All of these young men for Illinois asked to do so much more in Ron Kruger's first season as head coach, taking over for Lou Henson. He certainly made his solid contribution and was a difference in intercollegiate athletics. This is the first step in uh, building a proud tradition reborn in Champaign. And the stellar career of Keon Garris will come to a halt. Oldman launches and finally connects. 71-63, 15.4 remaining. A 20-second timeout for Illinois. A lot more yet to come. Coppin State, a school between Baltimore and Washington named after Fanny Jackson Coppin, a black slave, the first black woman ever to receive a college degree. Now on the map, they'll take on Texas in the east, Temple in Minnesota, Stanford and Wake Forest as... CBS Sports coverage of the road to the Final Four rolls on. 
Since Mac McCarthy received that technical foul, UT Chattanooga has outscored Illinois 30 to 18. Quick foul by Heldman. Then. That was really the crucial point in this game, both emotionally and in terms of the flow of the game. And to take you back, the score was tied at 41. And there was a tie-up between Isaac Connor and Kiwan Garris. It led to a double technical. And then ultimately, Mac McCarthy saw his team give up a four-point trip as two more fouls were called. And then he regathered his club and emotionally took control of that and the low post foul difficulty really for Illinois the difference in today's game. One of the things that I noticed was while Matt McCarthy was administering his protest to the officials, Johnny Taylor had the play the five starters off to the side and they were communicating them amongst each other as to what they had to do. The end of a magnificent career for Kiwan Garrett. Uh, congratulations to him and his growth, both under Lou Henson and now Lon Kruger. They'll be playing basketball again. You can bet on that. UT Chattanooga, the first 14 seed to make it to the Sweet 16 since Cleveland State in 86. And the first ever from the Southern Conference, they're on their way to Birmingham. Duncan against Stanford there. After this commercial, Seven, Jim. this one you think might be. Huh? It, it might be, and uh, one of the things that I'd like to see in this game is for uh, the officials to get into sync a little bit. We've seen some calls that have gone kind of crazy both ways. Example: How is that not a foul? Jim Young trying to shoot over Duncan. Look at Young oh. on the inside. I mean, this is ridiculous. The major the pushing referees are looking on. right at him and, and calling nothing. You can't have that. Duncan and Young really jockeying for position. And now, oh, and now just a gentle tap, and they call it on Young. This is ridiculous. Wait till you see some of this action away from the now, ball. Now, referee was looking right at this action here. Now, how is this? Look at this. It's ridiculous. And then they call a touch foul to go with it. Young second. This is a Stanford lineup that's uh, a three-guard lineup. Young got in foul trouble in the first half. In the, in the opening round, good fake. Look at the hand checking out here. This game is going to get rough. That one's three, goes awry, and Weems pulls down the rebound. Still 4-2, Cardinal leading. Lee dumps it inside, and a foul called on Sean Allen. His second. Well, Birmingham in the southeast, Regional now all set, and uh, that's the upset bracket. Kansas and Arizona, according to form at the top half, the one and the four. But Chattanooga and Providence will do a little Cinderella dance Friday night in Birmingham. Nice out of bounds play. Wake Forest goes man to man. Pick takes place. Allen out of it. Now, Jim, we're seeing Coach Montgomery doing something very interesting. He puts Madsen in the game. Now, we're talking about another guy that can bang and push. He sees that the referees are going to allow a lot of body contact, so he's going to use uh, his power players early on Duncan to try to get Duncan in foul trouble. Mark Madsen, number 45 for Stanford. 
Duncan saves it. 12 seconds on the shot clock. Duncan, he can knock down a three. At this time, and Peter Sauer, who made the last two, pulls down the rebound. Well, the die is cast now. This is going to be a physical hand-checking game. Nick Knight. Oh, how about that dribbling move by Tim Duncan? Knight did not commit a turnover on uh, Friday, but uh, that's his first of the tournament. Got caught in midair. And let's see if Wake Forest tries to take advantage of the fact that Peral at 6'11 is being guarded by Weems down the low post. He should be able to play over it. On Allen, and they say a foul on Sauer. And the bench right there says, wait a minute. What? Love to spread out. That's why we gave the new Chevy Malibu more room for five. Strategy yeah. again. You're working uh, and against the guy's body and also go against his mind. Well, Duncan's turned it over, Billy, a testament to that six times. Wake Forest goes to a zone for the first time today. 2-3 zone. Young travel. Outside, travel. You know what the problem was there, Jim? We saw Keith Van Horn in the morning of the first game. Remember his great ability to catch the ball first and make a play? Young was looking ahead at the play before he caught the ball. This is going to be interesting to see how Stanford goes against the zone. Trying to get Rutland a shot that he can make. There you go. Braswell scored on the last trip down the floor. This time Rutland gets his first point. All right, now it's got to be Weems to shoot some jump shots. Let's see what happens here. And Knight penetrates very well against the zone. Most of the times you'd say to a player, don't dribble against the zone, but with Knight, you can let him do it. Sauer hits the jumper. And without Peral in the middle, Wake Forest losing a lot of size in their normal zone defense. Sean Allen at six foot six, not like that long arm Ricky Peral. Good recovery by Lee. 10 point lead, 34 24. Duncan drives on Young, spins, lays it up, short. High up situation, and Wake Forest ball. And the fans, really Pac-10 fans right here doing a good job trying to root home a team that is normally a major enemy and opponent here. Duncan reaching over the top, gets it, can't make the handle, and then just dives in here on the action. Fans probably right on that one. He eventually got the ball, but before he got the body. Duncan and Young, it is amazing. I've never seen that kind of action in the college game as far as low post body. <laughs> it's amazing. No calls. Dave Odom is crazy. Knight pull up three. Dave Odom ought to call a 20-second timeout here. He's going to get a technical foul on himself. And then he's really going to be in trouble, particularly with the ball. He doesn't want to get a technical here. The official looked at him. Let him know that he doesn't need a technical. 37-24 after Knight drills the three. You're going to get a technical you want when the other team has the ball, but it takes away your possession. They get two and the ball back. And over the back, Allen. The strategy of Stanford has worked to perfection. They have frustrated Wake Forest. Tim Duncan walking with his head down. You don't see that often. Watch this banging by Young in here. Using his upper body. Pushing, shoving. Banging again. Forearm shiver. He gets by. Dave Odom cannot believe there's no call there. For Turkwin Mock. Freeman has not been able to get going. Pulls up. Oh. In and out. Rockington, a huge rebound. Singletary. Shaking and baking. Warwick will try. No. Rebound to Reggie Freeman looking to run. Should have gone back to Brockington. To clock in the paint. Oh. He'll get to the line. Texas will not back down, but in the half-court set, Coppin State should have found Brockington. He's hit some tough shots, impossible shots. Keep foul. going to the man at top. Fouls on Fred Warwick, his third. Vasquez comes back in. 
Reggie Freeman coming at you. Good slide of hand. And Clack gets inside, just can't finish. Warwick will go to a seat on the Coppin State bench. Brandy Perryman back there on the Texas bench. Clack. Thirteen now for Chris Clack in the game. Texas fans behind the Texas bench trying to get their crowd or get their ball club on gear. Clack, two big free throws. Susie Penders cheering the Longhorns on, but in this building right now, the Longhorn fans are the minority. That foul is going to be on Vasquez, and that's going to be his third. The finish by Welch. I tore the rim off. Never take any lead for granted in this tournament. Coppin State leads by a point. 12-29 left in the game, Clark. Well, clearly, when you've got teams that have athlete athletic ability, can score quickly and in bunches in transition, it's always tough to maintain a lead. Stanford leads 48-37 now. Down in Kansas City, Minnesota and Temple. When you play a John Chaney team, they're always in the game. They don't give up, do they? They typically don't, and if they get shots going, they only shot 29% in the first half. As they get shots going, then it fuels their tough defense at the other end. John Chaney's troops are shooting 75% this half. Minnesota, 25% this half. But they lead 37-29. Temple and John Chaney almost synonymous with March Madness. And they trail by seven now. So Duncan in the first half at 14 points, 17 rebounds. Now with two points and three rebounds in the second stanza. First ever from the ACC to lead the nation in rebounding. That's hard, hard to believe. Yeah, that is I, a I, I couldn't believe that when I heard yep. that. Two for two. Five point lead, 308. See Wake Forest pressing. They're not, they're not going to disrupt Stanford with a press. They got to just play solid half-court defense, bring it back basket at a time. It's a nice move by Dave Odom because uh, the, the power was all in Stanford's hands if you try to go chase this guy. Major defensive stop here. Lee gets by Rutland. Oh, Madison oh. blocks, and they call the foul on Duncan. Boy, oh, that looked like an awful good block. It looked clean. Madison's strength is what got him the foul. And four on Duncan. But Madsen, watch the strength in Madsen's hands here. If he doesn't have strength, that ball is knocked away. Duncan goes up. Wow. Two shots for Madsen. Duncan didn't agree. He turns and looks at the official. You start to feel the nerves for a great college player and wonder, is this going to be it? Will his dream, what he came back for one more year, will he come up short, way short? Yeah. of that promised land, the final four. He has four fouls now. Jim, I talked to him about it yesterday, and he said, you know, my career will be fulfilled if I do not get a chance to step up on that podium. It's something every player wants to do, but as long as I know I've given my best, that's all I could ask. So he has his head on straight. For all, tough shot. Banks it home. Again, five-point game, 2.15, Billy. You get down to the fact that these half-court stops are what's important for Wake, as you can see that they're not going to be able to force the pressure. They have not been a pressing team all year long. Hard to start now, particularly against probably the best pressure beater in the United States in Brevin Knight. And how do you get the ball out of his hands? You don't until he passes or shoots. Sour fade away. Hughes. That could be the killer there. Wake Forest just couldn't stop him in a half-court set. 140 remaining. Rutland on the drive. Stuck. Looks outside. Duncan dumps it over the top. Parole for two. 
Timeout, Wake. And there was the offensive strategy that Wake Forest employed only once in the first half. It was there available for him behind low. 22nd timeout. You didn't expect Sauer to be here after nope. they've worked the clock down so far. I think I said earlier today he's played such a solid game that won't show up in the stats so well, but he's been there in the big ones. And there's what I was talking about, Jim. Remember at the beginning of the game, three guards against the Wake size, and Wake never went to the high-low post. It really hurt him in the first half. Well, this was a war, this game. Tim Duncan, who was a swimmer as a young man, sister actually competed in the Seoul Olympics for the Virgin Islands in swimming. And when Hurricane Hugo swept across his island, it destroyed the pool, the club pool that uh, he was a member of the swim team. And he took up basketball then at the age of 14, gave up swimming. Had uh, just a prolific career at Wake Forest. National Player of the Year, 125. Still holding out hope is Duncan. Down five, it's just two possessions, so you don't really have to go for the foul on this one. You need a stop here. Peter Sauer has done it again. He's hit two jumpers in the last two minutes. The unexpected hero. But Wake gets the three and the timeout with a minute two to remaining. Wow, just when you're ready to count them out. Huge jump shot there, particularly from Rutland, who has had his problems, particularly in the first half of these NCAA tournament games. Remember last year, the young man had the knee problem, but he heard it in the Georgia Tech game, the last game of the ACC tournament. There he drills a long three off the dribble. And you talk about the need for a stop. It was 40-24 to 24 Stanford early in the second half. Wake has been chipping away, but been unable also at the same time to stop Stanford on its last two possessions. And Peter Sauer, the last guy you might expect, hitting jumpers from the outside. Well, he's, he's doing what's asked of him. Ricky Peral went over to try to go ahead and trap. Wake's trying to keep the ball now out of Knight's hands with a double team on, even a triple team. But they get it back to Knight, who hits ahead nicely. Stanford can afford to use a little clock here. There's Peral again, trying to go for the double teams. And Peral has got long arms, so a guard sometimes got to be careful trying to throw over his head. 15 on the shot clock. Weems. Oh, he got the five. pass over Braswell. 10 seconds. They don't want to foul now. Lee driving. Dishes. Sauer again. In and out. Put oh, my God. No one had a body on him. Duncan went out to try to stop Sauer, who has made two jump shots, so therefore nobody under the basket. And there's a big foul by Knight. Two threes, but uh, would have tied it, but that's the fourth foul on Knight. You see the replay, the drive inside. You see Duncan had to go out and get Sauer, who had just made two great jump shots. That left nobody under the basket for the block out. Arthur Lee. One of the smallest guys on the floor. Now, not small when nobody's with you underneath that basket. One and not one. Knocked out. One and one for Rutland. This to bring it to four. 23.3 remaining. Well, they need two possessions no matter how you look at it. Stanford's going to call a timeout just to get organized. That's a 20, a 20 second timeout. Stanford's asked for a full timeout. We'll be right back. Oh, oh, he made the oh, shot. What happened was there was a He whistle. made the shot. And Rutland, that will not count as an official attempt. It has to. He gave him the ball. Now they blew the whistle before he Jim, the attempted ball, the free throw. The ball was in the hands of the shooter. The shot went in. Rutland will get another shot. It really is kind of immature in a way because you've got two possessions if you're waiting, and he makes them both. Now, you have got to foul. The problem here is, Jim, that Stanford's three primarily ball handlers shoot 82, 76, and 80% free throw. Knight the best of the bunch at 82%. And they foul Knight. 
82% free throw shooter. We'll have two attempts. Four-point lead for the Cardinal. You know, I look at uh, Brevin Knight will probably be the, the Francis uh, Pomeroy Naismith player of the year, the best player under six foot in the United States. And you look over at the Wake Forest bench with the guy in somewhat of agony right now, Ricky Stokes, who led Virginia to two Final Fours. Uh, the one after Ralph Sampson in 84, who was also a winner of that award. But looking at two great leaders here. And so tough to stop this guy with pressure. Easily drilling the two and a timeout of 20. 27 timeout, 27 timeout called by Stanford. So two three-pointers needed by Wake Forest and uh, Billy 20.5 seconds remaining and, and uh, what are they setting up over there on the Demon Deacon side? Well, Jim, all you can do the rest of the way is just what they did there. You've got to go ahead and commit fouls and hope that the other team misses a free throw and then you go for three to try to catch up. Down six, you're at a two-possession ball game. That's all that's left. But as I said, you're talking about having to foul Brevin Knight and Brevin Knight's an 82% free throw shooter. He's great with the ball. To give you an example how great, in the last four ball games, this young man has 34 assists and four turnovers. Wow. You're talking about pressure basketball, Arizona, Arizona State, and then the two games in the NCAA tournament. Got to be thinking three and get up on the boards if you're Tim Duncan. Good shot. Braswell had the opener and tipped in by Perot. You could have asked for a better setup than that. Braswell Perfect. wide open from the corner. But 13.9 seconds, and it's still a four-point difference. There's the shot. And as I said, Duncan, or in this case, Perot, there for the rebound. And how important was that foul on Perot at the end of the first half where Dave Odom had the city? Timeout wait. Stanford ball with the lead by four. And Jim, you've got to foul as soon as this ball is touched inbounds and try to keep it away from Brevin Knight. Tough They're fouled. And they got Madsen going to the line for two. But here's the question. Peral commits the foul. That's his fifth. You know you're going to foul. Put a guy like Lauren Woods in the game. Let him commit the foul. And then Peral still be on the floor. So that's end of Ricky Peral's day and possibly career at Wake Forest. Ricardo Peral out of Spain. And you knew, Steve, Wake Forest double-teamed Brevin Knight to make sure he couldn't touch the ball, so the odd man out was Madsen. Two shots for Madsen. He lost eight-tenths of a second on that inbound pass. He's made all four attempts. Now missed for the first time today. But percentage-wise, the poorest free-throw yep, shooter 50, that's played. 59%, you said earlier. Right. How big were those jump shots now by Sauer, huh? Oh, huge back-to-back -back possessions. Missed them both. They can do just fine with a two right now. So two's as good as a three. They didn't need a three. And the, the poorest nowhere near the basket. Did not need the three. They needed two possessions. Take it on in. Stanford in a position, ten, uh, Jim, to uh, eliminate Tim Duncan as a college player. He will go down as the first player ever in the NCAA history to have over 2,000 points, 1,000 rebounds, over 400 blocks, and over 200 assists. Sauer, that's some line. We'll have one more. Sauer has been the man of the hour. He was very poetic How today. How about that? Stanford is heading to the regional. They know the answer to the first back to rack. Tune. They know the way to San Jose. They are going on to play Utah in the Sweet 16. Tim Duncan gave his ex-roommate from the 22 and under team, Brevin Knight, a hug. Some contest, some strategy by Mike Montgomery. That's what set up this game and the outcomes for his team. Duncan lost his mother on his 14th birthday back in 1990. He said he lived by the motto that she taught him. Good, better, best, never let it rest. 
So your good is better, and your better is best. Best was not enough, however, today against Stanford. And the Stanford Cardinals will face Utah in San Jose at the West Regional with Kentucky and St. Joseph's qualifying yesterday out of Salt Lake City. The Chevrolet most valuable players of the game, Brevin Knight. For Stanford, Tim Duncan closing out a phenomenal college career wins the award for the Demon Deacons. Now back to Pat O'Brien in New York. All right, Jim, thank you. Stanford goes to the regional semifinals for the first time since 1942. They'll play 20 miles in Palo Alto. Let's go back to Pittsburgh now. Texas leads by two. Fang Mitchell cannot believe Reggie Freeman was trapped in the backcourt with no timeouts and they called a foul on Turkwin Mott, who has fouled out of the game. How about the shot? Reggie Welch doesn't call board, but it counts. Here's the foul. Freeman nowhere to go, has, doesn't have a timeout. There's the grab of the arm. And Turkwin Mott goes to the bench with 16 points. Reggie Freeman steps to the free throw line. If he makes them both, he can force two possessions. Kareem Lewis will come in. Mott, the most outstanding player in the MEAC this year. Freeman, who's had 15 second half points at one point, had 14 of 16, had 11 in a row, has stepped up just large this second half. This is the big one now, 81-78. 52-9 on the clock. Oh, what a half Reggie Freeman has had. What a performance by the senior. 31 on Friday. And now the big second half this afternoon. Singletary gets a little screen from Lewis. They get into man defense. Brockington. He's been the man. Time out, Coffin State. Can't give him a step. Tough off the dribble. Tuck just pulling up and shooting the basketball. There may have been a better basketball game in this tournament, but I don't know where it was. The genuine Chevrolet players of the game here in Pittsburgh, Antoine Brockington from Coppin State, Reggie Freeman from Texas, magnificent performances by both young men. What a ball game, Mike. What a ball game. Turkwin Mott sitting on the bench watching his teammates trying to get 42 seconds if they can come from behind. Louisville awaits. Perryman will make the inbound pass. Now he gets it to Freeman. They get it to Jordan. Back to Freeman. Freeman nearly got picked from behind. Got it ahead and said the clock now gets it back. Seven second difference between the shot clock and game clock. Brockington the steal. Coffin State's got the ball and a chance to win. Brockington and Coffin State will take a timeout. Listen to this building. Back for the final 19 seconds. Texas with the 82-81 lead. Here's a look at what's coming up tonight at 60 minutes. You'll see all those programs in their entirety. The ball is inbounded to Singletary. The Singletary good off the dribble. Brockington good off the dribble. Welch and Warwick are the shooters. Singletary takes it down to 10. Going to take it himself. Going to take it himself. Singletary oh, gifted by Freeman out of bounds. Wanted it all by himself. Freeman answered that time. And now, Coffin State will inbound with 4.2 on the clock. And they're going to use a 20-second timeout. Great defensive play by Reggie Freeman. I guess. And the help weak side. 
Weak side help as they go baseline. Shake and bake, and Freeman's there. Look at Chris Clack coming for the help, though. They do not get enough credit, folks, for their full court and half court defense. Chris Clack right there could have been a call. The block by Freeman, Coppin State has 4.2 left. Coppin State trying to write history in the next 4.2 seconds. Neither team with a timeout left. 82, 81, Texas by one. Warwick will inbound for Coppin State. And if Texas wins, it's a mad back from January 19th, the overtime game against Louisville that was played in Austin. Little team meeting going on along the way in there. Again, Welch is a shooter. Can pop off the pick. Warwick taking it out to shooter. Warwick looking, looking. Oh, by the Texas, Texas advances. The rematch with Louisville. From an overtime ball game in Austin. Michael, the emotions of March Madness. Coppin State, what an effort. Coppin State will not soon be forgotten. Chico Vasquez has had a tough ball game, folks, handling the ball. He's been picked a couple times. He did the picking this time himself. Biggest play of the year for Tom Penders in the Longhorn Ball Club. Two one-point games today here in Pittsburgh. North Carolina and Cal on one side up at Syracuse. Louisville and Texas on the other. Pat O'Brien will be coming by. This has been a presentation of CBS Sports Home of the Men's NCAA Basketball Championship. Dramatic basketball here on a Sunday evening mm -hmm. in New York City. Pat O'Brien along with Clark Kellogg. Let's get you up to date. Texas uh, withholds a challenge from Coppin State. Beating him by a point with the Duan Vasquez interception at the end. Big shots all game long by Reggie Freeman, especially the second half. And then we saw Tim Duncan's final college basketball game as they go down against Stanford, 72 to 66. Stanford moves on to San Jose, 20 miles from Palo Alto, and Minnesota all over Temple towards the end of the game anyway. And they won 76 impressively to 57. We begin our regional semifinals on Thursday at 7:30. Iowa State, UCLA. Clemson and Minnesota, St. Joe's against the defending champion Kentucky, Stanford and Utah. And then on Friday we begin at 7.30 and North Carolina meets Cal. Cal, big strong physical team, a rematch in that Texas-Louisville game they met earlier this year. Texas and Louisville, Arizona and Kansas, and then a matchup that you kind of like, Chattanooga and Providence. Heck, at this point I like them all, Pat. So we've had 48 games and we're down to our Sweet 16 and we'd like to congratulate Texas but thank Coppin State for teaching us a whole lot about heart. Good night, everybody. Approximately 10, 9, give or take. We made the first free throw. He's a sophomore from Los Angeles. He's played both guard spots this year. Mike Montgomery says he's trying to get him ready for next year, and he'll run the point as Revan Knight graduates. The man is what he said. He will be in charge. Seven-point game. The Cardinal hanging in there, but running out of time. 4.08 remaining. Here's their high-low little look now. And Horn traveled. Little shuffle step at the elbow by Keith Van Horn. Revan Knight lets the ball roll. No five count anymore on that play. Used to be five seconds would start 
The minute the ball was released by the inbounder, Weems going up to shoot a three, and he'll take three from the line as Drew Hansen fouled him for his third personal. What a great reaction defensively. Unfortunately, they forced him way out for the three and closing out. Got that little hand in there. He's just gone straight up. It was a great closeout. Knight just delivers it correctly. Weems is there. Bang, you got a chance to get a shot off. Big free throw. Weems gets the bounce on the first. He's a 77% free throw shooter and this is an excellent Stanford team from the line 74 and a half percent collectively back in the Pac-10 so you knew the miss was coming on cue uh, fundamentally sound much like their coach and 16 of 20 from the line tonight the Cardinals 17 of 21 and a timeout it's a five-point game 354 remaining in San Jose you Three out of five from the line. Madsen in the corner. Kicking it around with Doliak, the scrum, and here comes that arrow in the play. Utah ball with a minute 24 remaining. Boy, Madsen's had his hand all game on balls. Haven't been able to come up with it. Uh, the 20. Now, neither team has a 20 remaining as Stanford uses its last. Mike Montgomery used the expression Murphy's Law at halftime, talking about the way the first half went. It's been a little bit better here in the second half, but they've had a number of little things like what we just saw. Madsen unable to corral the ball when it was his for the taking that has played a major part in the Cardinal being behind by six. Beginning of the game, they really struck a lot of fumbles on night passes. But Utah has a resiliency. We've seen through the course of the year that they know how to win close games. Of course, Van Horn helps at the buzzer frequently in that category. But there's a toughness that Rick Majerus has about his guys. And Miller is part of that. I mean, the ability to run the team and yet help in the box, cover the backcourt. Miller just understands exactly what he wants to run. Here's the full court press. They've got to be careful with the leak out. And Horn went to the ball. He's the best free throw shooter in the whack. They'd like the ball in his hands. They don't want it in Miller's hands, and he lost it on the sideline. What a great use of the 20, though. Change the look, throw a little wrinkle out there, and see how the club reacts. When they, Mike Montgomery has raised his stock as a tactician in this tournament. People who didn't know about him know about him now. Well, it seems they only didn't know about him in California. The rest of the coaching profession does. Bauer with some big shots against Wake. Tip in by Madsen. It was just barely out of the cylinder in a legal play for Madsen. Sure was. He is tough around the rim. Here comes a little double. He's got to stay at home. Don't gamble. Van Horn's a 90% free throw shooter. They don't want to foul him. You see the game clock at 50 seconds. The shot clock is now at 15. Now just play solid P now. Don't foul. Hansen, a strong move to the bucket. And that's everybody on the perimeter running around, freed up Hansen. Great time for his first points of the night. Knight was fouled, and he nearly had a chance for three. He'll shoot a pair. The foul is on Caton, and he has fouled out for Utah. Now you look for tightness on defense, and everybody roaming around outside. You see the late little shape up there to pick up the charge by Lee. But a wonderful look, and then Hansen, who just adds to the mix. He's not trying to ruin anything, contribute solidly, do whatever he can to help his club. Hayden departs with three points. He's a senior, hoping that this will not be his final game. Utes trying for the third time in the 90s to reach the Elite Eight. As Rick Majerus said, they haven't been able to get over this hump during his tenure. 91, they lost to an outstanding UNLV team in the Sweet 16. Last year, they got throttled by Kentucky, the eventual national champion, in the Sweet 16 in Minneapolis. All the respect of many, uh, what he's been consistently able to do, one of the funny people in basketball, but he's all serious, all business out here. It's like he's dining. Eight out of eight from the line tonight is Brevin Knight. He has seven assists and only one turnover. The Cardinals back within four. Thirty-nine and a half seconds remaining. Utah leads by four. And the youth will inbound the ball. Stanford with 
one timeout left. Utah has two. And build a strategy. Well, Sean, when you think of the last time they pressed, they did a great job. Miller had a turnover. You don't want Miller to really have the basketball. I think he may inbound it because of his poor free throw shooting. Maybe it's a time for Van Horn to go back and bring the basketball up, particularly if they go straight up man, Stanford. Miller, the worst free throw shooter on the court for Utah, and he throws it into the best Van Horn. Now Jackson, the freshman, put in the ball game by Rick Majerus. And he'll take a pressure pack trip to the line. Minnesota has reclaimed the lead over Clemson by two. We'll get you to that game as soon as we're finished here. Rick Majer is showing faith in David Jackson, the freshman from Portland, Oregon. He is 69% from the line. Hasn't been there very often this year. 18 out of 26. Lee committed his fourth foul. Mm, the luxury of two didn't help on that one. Big thing for Stanford now on a long rebound. They got a squeeze, and Utah conversely, a tip back out. Jackson forced into the game with the departure of Kate and the fouls. He missed both of Van Horn, a huge rebound. The size, and Lee unable to squeeze Van Horn. Oh my, oh my goodness, the pass right through the hands of Jackson. Stanford had a chance to foul Andre Miller who's one out of four in this half from the line. Instead, they let him pass, and it worked out for the Cardinal. They have the ball with 30 seconds left, down by four. Knight down the lane. Oh, Picked up the lingerie. Did he blow by anybody? Miller, pretty good defender, unable to contain the overdrive of Knight. Now, Sean, this is just going up a notch. Hit the accelerator. How about the reverse? He's so used to protect the basketball as the Stanford Cardinal supporters on the bench go wild. He used that rim beautifully. Back in San Jose for the final 26.3 seconds of regulation. Utah leads by two. Revan Knight about to attempt a free throw. Each team with one timeout remaining. Mr. and Mrs. Knight, Brenda on the left, Melvin on the right, agonizing over the upcoming free throw. Brevin has been perfect from the line tonight. Eight out of eight. The last time they were within two, the Cardinal was at six to four with 10.29 remaining in the first half. And Charlie, they got to stretch the game. On this make, it's set. The quick giveaway. And they take Revan Ice to get out to get the foul. Let's see. Mosley is into the game, and Knight will go off. This is a catch given. He's got a length in this game, even though it's only one. And Utah has been shaky down the stretch. The Utes have made one of their last five free throws. And they had a shaky turnover a moment ago and a pass by Miller that went through the hands of Jackson. Miller inbound to Doliak. Madsen. Call for a foul, either Madsen or Weems, who converged on Doliak. Now Mike Montgomery's guys have reacted beautifully defensively. They made it tough on Rick and his people. Not really another point mentality out there with Miller on the floor. Hanson more of an off guard, and they relied on their big people to screen and step back to the ball in Doliak. Four fouls on Madsen. Doliak 75% from the season from the line and perfect tonight. He'll shoot two with his team leading by one, 25 seconds remaining. Courage. Step up key times. Miller should do a good job trying to deny Brevin Knight the basketball. Ten points for Doliak, all the second half. Now three to tie for Stanford. Knight lost the dribble. Loose ball, Stanford ball. Last touch on the floor by the Utes, Drew Hansen. What a play by Andre Miller. He faked at the basketball. Oh, was that terrific. Everything but the pill. Need a pinch now on the dribble penetration. Knight. Tough shot with Miller guarding Van Horn, dropped it out of bounds. And a timeout called by Mike Montgomery with 10 seconds left now. They really need to take a three. Back 
in a moment. U.S. gold medalist Mia Hamm spends 90 minutes destroying her hair and 90 seconds bringing it back with Per Plus. More than a shampoo, it conditions too. How? As you shampoo, the conditioners stay suspended. As you rinse, the conditioners go to work, giving you great hair simply. Perfect for Mia. Because she wants great hair, but she'd rather be living in it than working on it. Wouldn't you? Pert Plus. Simply great hair. Simply. Utah has not trailed in this game. They are clinging to a three-point lead. With 10.2 seconds left, it'll be Stanford ball. And Sean, uh, as you pointed out on the commercial, they got to get the three. By the time you get started, it'll be eight seconds. They run reams along the baseline for a three. They run a pick and roll with Brevin Knight staying behind the screener in the three. They love to go to the box and diagonally out for a three. Weems and Knight are their two best three-point shooters. Stanford is two out of 11 in the game. Knight, a very tough shot. And that's a three from the corner. Last chance for Utah. Knight got a hand on the ball. Johnson the steal. For the win is the buzzer. No, no. Van Horn drops it in after the buzzer sounded and the Utes and Cardinal will go to overtime on an unbelievable three out of the corner by Knight. As big as the three was, he's the one that got the steal to disrupt the push up at the other end. Now this is a little guy who's developed an upper body and this upper body enabled him to make this shot, Sean. I would say two years ago, he couldn't do this. He doesn't have his legs totally, but the extra ump with the upper body, one to be remembered in Stanford history. But how about him? He's the one that got a piece of the ball that ends up with a steep one. And you can see, he didn't hear the horn, which signifies the end of the game, but the light came on later. We'll come back for the overtime from San Jose in a moment. Well, Bre I knew Brevin Knight, Sean McDonough, always had some courage, but under fire, a well-designed play by Mike Montgomery. They're terrific at scoring on inbounds passes. He took the hit. That could very well have been four. And then getting back and getting involved with the deflection and disrupting the flow for Utah. Stanford closed it out with an 8-2 to two run. Utes missed some free throws, a couple of turnovers. First time this score has been even since it was 0-0. Utah got out to a 4-0 lead, and the Cardinals didn't catch them to the final 10 seconds. Stanford controls the tip. Sauer has it ripped away by Hansen. And Doliak didn't screen him off. It was a perfect tip. He didn't keep him out of the play. The most relieved man in the building at the moment is Doug Oliver, the Stanford assistant who drew the key technical that might have been the difference in the game. Had it ended with Stanford losing in regulation. Madsen a good catch. Stanford still has not had the lead in the game. Hobbling a little bit is Brevin Knight. John, he's struggling getting back. Placing a little downstream by Van Horn. Oh, and that's five on Keith Van Horn. So he has fouled out. A huge development as the best player in University of Utah history goes to the bench. And this is the down screen. I mentioned early in the game, he likes the screen. You got to stand perfectly still. And a little bit of a bump, but the reaction by Knight got the official's attention. I think I would let him play on on that one, huh? Rick Majerus restrained by Donnie Daniels, his assistant. He was in the face of Frank Scagliata and waving a finger at the official. After Van Horn was whistled for his fifth foul, he leaves with 25 points and 14 rebounds. You know, I'm not suggesting that Medela becomes the heir apparent to Van Horn, but he's got those types of abilities offensively, and Van Horn was giving a little pep talk going out the floor. They're going to need some offense. They've been struggling at that end of the floor. First time Van Horn has fouled out this year. Meanwhile, Nate Knight has played more than 13 minutes with four fouls. And that's his first free throw miss of the night. They've hidden them. They've disguised them defensively, Brevin Knight. Been able to roam around and not be involved in the action on Miller. Stanford's first lead of the game came 34 seconds into overtime. 
And now Utah forced to play the OT without two starters, most notably Van Horn, but Caton has fouled out as well. It's Hanson to Miller with Doliak, Metala, and Johnson. High low. Goliath, nice save by Metala, and the Utes take a one-point lead. Uh, they got confidence in that play. Good big guys can see the vision to get it over the top. Metala so, stepped out on Knight, leaving Sauer open. Rebound, Goliath. And they have not been able to convert that. That's the first real good look Sauer's had on it. He made that exact same shot in a couple of key spots down the stretch. In the win over Wake Forest in round two. Well, Bill, without Van Horn and Caden, if you're Utah, do you try to run the shot clock down as I, many times as you can on offense? I think they're struggling on offense. I think they got to run their stuff. I think they got to go power game. I thought they should have with Van Horn. They're trying to set it up now. Miller has been hit. And he continues to be just that. 16 for Miller. The Utes without Van Horn have taken a three-point lead. Well, if he takes over, you may have to put Knight back on him to contain that penetration. Three minutes left in overtime. Neither team has played an overtime game this year. Three by Wayne. Boy, did he work. He decided on that side. They had a double on one, a single rub on the other. Seventy-one, seventy-one. They got a double choice here. Nice catch. Madsen called for the hook as Goliak was getting ready to accept the pass. And Madsen has fouled out. So it's a battle of attrition. Young and Madsen, a couple of the big bodies for Stanford are out on foul as are Van Horn and Caden of Utah and there's that great penetration the ability to find the seam create and here's a great three after a double on one side a single on the other and all game long Utah's done a nice job reacting to that particular play uh, but late fatigue sets in and different bodies on the floor Goliak has been strong from the line under three remaining in San Antonio Minnesota has gone back up by five over Clemson. Watch free throws by Goliak. He is 10 out of 10 from the line. Two and a half minutes left in overtime. Midway through the extra session, used by two. One forward, I'd like to turn the corner and find somebody. Oh, oh, nice turn the corner. He ran into Hansen, and that's five on Hansen. So he is the third starter to go out on foul. So difficult to contain Brevin Knight. And then when they put everybody baseline, Sean, he loves to initiate some contact. He'll go to the guy, and that's from playing a lot of tough playground basketball. You search the body, and then try and get to the line. So the freshman, David Jackson, will come back in for Utah. Hanson leaves the ball game. Three starters have fouled out. Caton, the first to leave. Then Van Horn, and now Hanson. There's Jackson. So it's Miller, Jackson, Metala, Doliak, and Johnson on the court. Three freshmen. Under this intense pressure for the Utes. Knight makes it a one-point game. He's 11 of 12 from the line. Tied again at 73. Still a matchup at the point. Lee and Miller. Majerus wants a 20-second timeout. And is granted a timeout. He has no 20. Therefore, it will be a full timeout. And we'll return to San Jose in a moment. Well, the first half wasn't exactly an artistic thing of beauty, but the action has been pulsating since here at the San Jose Arena. Young and Madsen have fouled out for Stanford. Caton, Van Horn, and Hansen have fouled out for Utah, and you have to give the Utes credit. They squandered the lead at the very end of regulation. They're badly undermanned here in overtime, but they're matching the Cardinals score for score here in the extra set. Finding ways, and Miller is the main reason, the ability to penetrate, and Goliak 
shaping up. It's going to be important the post passing and the three quarter defense of Sanford. They got to get in front. The flag. Sauer giving up that post entry. Not a lot guarded by Sauer. He's got some moves. He's confident. You can't let him catch it that easy. The freshman from Helsinki puts the youth back up by two under two minutes remaining in the first overtime. Little double screen now. Johnson, tough step for him, but he guarded Knight well. Knight thought he was fouled. Johnson, the defender, came up with the ball off the glass. And he may have been initiating. He's lucky maybe in a way he didn't get the foul. Went body searching. Knight has played nearly 17 minutes now since picking up his fourth foul without getting nailed for the fifth. Utah by two, Medela, bodies fly, blocking call against Stanford. It's on Sauer, and that's his fourth. And a nice call by Ted Hillary, too. He did try and bait the official into that. And Mike Montgomery, that little move of Brevin off the basketball plane, Miller kept him in the game, and here is the you bet we'll keep your game up on the line, but let's send you out to Midwest and take a look in on that. 20 seconds left, Minnesota at the line. They lead 71 to 68 over a tough Clemson squad. Tim Ryan, Al McGuire, courtside. By uh, Clem Hutchins. Clem Hutchins is playing Clemson. Clem Haskins. You're excited. 20 seconds Got left. Four two. point game. I get it. You know, it's the, the coach. They're coaching blood. two teams. I mean, it's pretty difficult. The coaching blood gets back in. <laughs> Step it up to coach one. You're coaching them both there. 20 seconds remain. A four point game. It's a three point lead for Utah. 76 73. Show early on night. Lee. Long as Miller contested the three and got tipped out by Jackson to Johnson. A couple of freshmen in the right spot. And now the youth with a minute to go in overtime of a three point lead in the ball. Beautiful tapping by Weidman at good inside position. He has had three huge baskets tonight, including the buzzer beater at the half that brought him to five. It's a two-point game again. All right, Minnesota leads by two, 72 to 70. We'll keep you posted on this. There's eight seconds left in the contest. Let's go back to Utah Stanford now on San Jose and Sean and Bill. Arthur Lee of Stanford fouls out with 48 seconds left in overtime. He leaves with 11 points. And two rebounds. And here's David Mosley, the freshman who's seen spot duty tonight. And he's a guy that Rick mentioned to both of us. He's concerned about Mosley. Very active kind of performer. Two free throws by Miller. Even with one out of two, he makes it a two-possession game. Andre, two out of five from the free throw line. 57% overall for the year. Inhale all the years of practice. Just be comfortable and confident. One out of two. It's a four-point game, 48 seconds left in overtime. Got to help on Knight now. He's got to pay attention. One four look. Knight, nice bounce to the baseline. Sauer in the bucket. What a creative move. The kiss at the end by Sauer. And the quick foul applied by Weems on Miller. There's only a four-second difference between the game clock of the shot clock so Stanford needed either the quick steal or the foul when they didn't get the steal Weems committed his first foul how is it possible that he's played virtually the whole game in a game like this with so many fouls and he only has one he's avoiding the issue but how about Montgomery's got the first 10 minutes they had no concept of what Stanford was doing they didn't recognize their team but they hung tough and obviously Knight does step up during prime time at the second half Miller has made two in a row now. The lead back to three for the Utes. 35.3 seconds remaining. 
The way he strokes that ball, it's certainly not Miller time on the foul line. He's hoping. 19 points for Miller. Good back, shot. Back to a two possession game. They doubled Knight out high. That's a three point try that wouldn't go from Wayne. Rebound Johnson fouled by Van Ellswick. Jeff Johnson, one of those thrust into action with the disqualification due to fouls of Van Horn and Hanson and Caton, and he's made several big plays. He sure and David Jackson also got a piece of that rebound to slap it to Johnson. Pretty good reaction. First free throw of the game for Johnson, 59% for the year. And that's way off. He hasn't been there much. Now 16 of 28 for the season. The freshman from Murray, Utah. Can't say it's the altitude effect in some of these releases. Five-point game, 25 seconds left in overtime. They're doubling up. Should get open up an easy jumper somewhere. Mosley a trouble on the handle. Top shot. He was fouled. Ooh, what a giveaway. All right, eight seconds left in San Antonio. Minnesota leads by two. Timeout in San Antonio again. There's eight seconds, as we said, and we'll get you to the finish of that and keep an eye on that. Meantime, 20 seconds left in San Jose in the overtime, our third overtime game in this tournament. Utah leads by five. Let's go courtside once again to Sean and Bill. David Mosley makes his first free throw attempt of the night to get Stanford back within four. 20.4 seconds left in overtime before the second free throw. Utah uses its final timeout. Here's the situation. Minnesota leads by two. They have the ball. There's eight seconds and a tick left on the clock. Two ticks, actually. Let's go down courtside to Tim Ryan and Al McGuire for this finish. Full timeout. They are out of timeout. Minnesota with a 20 and two foals remaining. 8.2 on the clock. Very, very difficult foul shot this time here for Quincy Lewis because he came off the bench for ball handling the last couple of minutes. And um, this is what we call a gut check. Sophomore from Little Rock, Arkansas. Yep. This is the first. Now this is the big one because this is the one that because most likely Clemson will take a three-point shot coming down because of the clock if he misses. So he makes this. The, the worst they can do is go to OT if he makes it. Missed it. Oh, this is it. It has been Stanford trying to foul and cannot. Great ball movement by the Utes, and they foul Doliak, and he's the man. Utah wants to go to the line. He's been brilliant from the strike tonight. All right, drama indeed here on a Thursday night in the tournament. Let's go to San Jose and show you the finish of that one. Utah is at the line. They lead by three. There's nine seconds left as you look at Michael Doliak. Let's go courtside to Sean McDonough and Bill Raftery. They had put Jackson in Stanford to give it away. They just couldn't get coordinated. Michael Doliak, one of only two remaining starters in the game for Utah. And he has made all the clutch free throws down the stretch. Utes by five. Mosley. Utah has gotten over the hump in their third try under Rick Mc. 
Jarrett, the youth, advance to the Elite Eight. Terrific comeback by Stanford. They tied it on a three-pointer in the final seconds of regulation by Brevin Knight to force overtime. But then enormous credit to the group of youth who played in the overtime without Van Horn, without Caton, without Hansen, overcoming major obstacles. The youths win by five. Their 14th straight win. Chevrolet most valuable players of the game are Brevin Knight of Stanford, 27 points and nine assists. And Michael Doliak making many key free throws for Utah down the stretch. 16 points and six rebounds. The Utes will meet the winner of the game between Kentucky and St. Joseph's, which comes your way next. From San Jose, here's Pat O'Brien. Send everybody out to San Antonio where our other overtime game is underway in overtime. 4.15 left. Clemson leads 75-72 courtside with Tim Ryan and Al McGuire. Charles Thomas will be at the line for Minnesota. Third personal on Terrell McIntyre. Clemson leads by three on the three-pointer from their team leader, Greg Buckner, the junior from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Charles Thomas at the line for Minnesota. Charles Thomas is big time from the foul line, 79%. Now let's go back just a few minutes here. You see the break on that. Missed free throw. This is going into overtime. It's five seconds left. They broke away from the foul shot. Made both of them. Well, Thomas made them both. And what happened there? Buckner broke down the court after the miss by Quincy Lewis. And it was Tony Christie at the buzzer forcing overtime for Clemson. He's doomed. I knew he was doomed. He couldn't make a shot all game. And every shot he put up was perfect. Merle Cole to shoot those at 36%. 10 points in the game for Cole, the senior. Perfect form by Cole. Four-point lead, Tigers. 3.45 to go in the first overtime. Jacobson. Forced that three-pointer. Rebounded by Weidman. Weidman's playing the game of his life underneath. He's a big space eater under there, but he's bringing down a rebound. McIntyre driving. McIntyre got away with a walk that time. Jacobson hot from three earlier. Now four of ten for Minnesota from three-point range. Buckner has just hit the three. Starts to drive. It's pull up for two. Buckner will carry the team on his shoulders. Great. Buckner. Six-point lead. Six we point talked point. about the leadership of Bobby Jackson and Greg Buckner. It's Buckner's turn to shine right now. Jackson with the ball. 2.50. Remaining first overtime. John Thomas. Courtney James pulls his way in and hits. Courtney James. He's been missing those shots during regulation. Seven points for him. He averages 8-3 a game. Four-point lead Clemson. The four seeds from the ACC in that large entry. Number 14 in the country, McIntyre driving, gets it back again, misses from short range, and Jackson rebounds. Jackson will blow by you if you move out of the post there. James is taking too much post position. Jackson for Jacobson, lots of room to shoot, won't go for him. Suddenly cold to Sam Jacobson. Rebound Jake Weidman. Jacobs sh shoots better when someone's in his face. Wide open and all alone. Four-point game, Clemson. Minnesota, 29 and three, the top seeds in the Midwest, ranked number three in the country. Ah, uh -uh, they're making a little mistake here, I think, and I'm not second-guessing anybody. It's a little too soon to go for the clock. Ah, go ahead and second-guess it. No, I don't like to second-guess. So I make my statement before they do what they do. A little bit too soon. Three-point try from Code off the mark. Rebound, Thomas. John Thomas. Jackson got to penetrate. Take him. He's going to roll away. Jackson off the glass. What a Cole shot. Jackson. 
29 points for Bobby Jackson. He scored every possible way. Two-point game again. Clemson, 80 to 78. 110 to go in the first overtime. Buck to go down low in the post. That's where you're excellent at. Coach Amell, McIntyre. Liz Buckner working the outside on the perimeter. McIntyre, he drives. Never got the shot off. Grabbed by Minnesota. Jackson comes out. Jackson, even the numbers aren't right, he's going all the way. Nobody near him. Tied up a little too soon, a little too soon. 31 for Bobby Jackson. Tied at 80, under a minute. Minnesota going to get the ball back, so no matter what happens, they're going to get a shot. McIntyre, watched by Charles Thompson. Weidman. His pass intended inside for Buckner. They lost off the foot. They want, to, they want to get the ball in the Buckner, but that time he was gone. He's very fortunate it went off the foot. Clemson ball, 28.6 to go, first overtime. And Haskins signals timeout. 18 seconds on the shot clock, so you got a spread of about 10 seconds. Plenty of time. Bobby Jackson, he looks like the game just started. His facial expression never changes. He's so poised, so relaxed. Plus, he's playing with four fouls, but now he knows it's now or never, so he's not pussyfooting around. When he came in originally off the four fouls in the late in the second half, he was pussyfooting around. Tied at 80. Now the 20s are gone for both teams. Minnesota still with their fulls. Clemson with one. Jackson has gone 12 and a half minutes now with four fouls on him. Minnesota comes out man to man, not covering the man, throwing the ball in. 18 seconds on the shot clock. Now Jacobson comes up and covers Buckner. Into the corner, McIntyre's pass, stolen. A good feed from McIntyre. Alert Minnesota play. Tied at 80, 13 seconds counting down. Coach Trun says, go easy, do it yourself. Jackson, wait another two seconds. Now do your thing, Jackson. Do your thing, baby. Cold all over him. Pulls up the jumper. Won't go. Oh! Into the second Into overtime. Time. Into the second overtime. We're tied at 80 at the Alamo Dome. Minnesota and Clemson. We'll be right back. Earth presents Penn's Oil at the Half, sponsored by Penn's Oil, formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Penn's Oil. Hi, everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien, and welcome to Penn's Oil at the Half. Let Clark Kellogg and I tell you what it's like to watch these games with two <laughs> coaches on each side of you <laughs> screaming back and forth. But uh, uh, Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski, are. Uh, uh, Rick Pitino earlier was saying that he looked like a Division II team because they were so banged up. I don't think so, Rick, huh? Well, I, I wouldn't schedule any of those <laughs> Division II teams. They, they look like the experienced team and like they've been there before, and I think that's why they have that double-digit lead. And taking advantage of a lot of mistakes on St. Joe's part. Well, I feel, like, feel a key barometer for Kentucky is turnovers. They produce 26 points a game off of turnovers. Already they have 11 off of eight St. Joe turnovers. All right, out in the Midwest, Iowa State and UCLA, LA, Iowa State jumped out to a 27-18 start. The Bruins in the Sweet 16 after an early exit last year trying to change that. Clark Kellogg, how about Dedrick Willoughby connecting here? Well, they've got to ride his shooting. Here he is on penetration. Nice ball movement and spacing. Hoop and harm from behind the three-point line. That was a four-point play for Willoughby. Kenny Pratt muscles his way in off the baseline, lays it in for a two, and Coach K, Tim Floyd looks confident here, doesn't he? Tim Floyd is a very confident coach, and I think it, it shows in his players. His, his exuberance and his confidence is exhibited by his players' play out on the, on the basketball court. To let you know, they are in a timeout down in San Antonio. We'll get you there uh, as soon as we can. Let's get you up to date on what happened earlier on Overtime Thursday here on CBS. Minnesota and Clemson went to double overtime, the final 90-84. Clemson uh, celebrating early there at a quick chance. This is Bobby Jackson, huh? Boy, he had it going on big time. Off the hook, there's a triple. Three of his 36 on the night. And then Sam J Sam Jacobson. The J squared combo. Jacobson, com he and Jackson combined for 65 points. And then Clemson battles back into this. Watch his uh, Tony Christie bucket. Spins and puts it on in, and afterwards, we talked to Bobby Jackson, definitely the hero of this game. Here's what he had to say about the game. The guys know 
um, we had to play hard uh, when uh, it was crunch time. And we just sucked it up and played really hard and listened to what Coach Hassett had to say. The hero tonight, Minnesota, will be in the Elite Eight. Utah is going to the Elite Eight for the first time in, since 1966. They beat Stanford this afternoon in overtime, 82 to 77. Mike Montgomery and his staff uh, playing close to home. Ten seconds left in regulation. Stanford down by three. Brevin Knight takes that shot from the corner, and it goes in. Overtime, Keith Van Horn fouls out on the bench. Hano Madala hits a turnaround jumper, Clark. First-year player with good ball skills, and he's 6'9". Watch this move. Spin, drop step, sweet finish. After the game, Mike Mayock caught up with Rick Majerus, who had this to say. Now you're one game away from a Final Four. You got to go through either St. Joe's or Kentucky. Any preference? Well, no, not really. I mean, you got to play somebody. But I told Martelli in the hallway tonight that there is a guy, two fat ball guys will face each other tomorrow. <laughs> I don't think we need to be calling Phil Martelli fat, do we, tonight? 82-77 in OT there. Back in action in San Antonio. Let's go on out. Iowa State leads UCLA 27-18. Courtside with the Ryan Express. Tim Ryan and Al McGuire. Tim? Chris Johnson for UCLA. Outside for O'Bannon. 2-3 zone. Bailey Johnson. Good movement by the Bruins. And a hit by Dollar. Six points for Dollar, 27 to 20. Seven point Iowa State lead, 6.38 to go in the first half. Willoughby inside. Cato, Bankhead jumper off the back iron. O'Bannon rebound. Pass intended for Henderson off the mark. Ruin turnover, five of those so far. You can see a UCLA. Picking up a bit, they're now 8 of 20 from the field. They were 2 of 10 at one point. On the other hand, 11 of 20 Cyclone shooting. You know, there's, there's a reason, I think, why UCLA is kind of on the weak side playing at the present time. Those two overtimes, waiting back there in the locker room that long to come out. Well, anybody would say it affects both teams. Hato. But the other team took the turn very well. So it didn't affect them. Holloway's <laughs> miss, rebounded by the Bruins. 5.47 to go, seven-point game. Iowa State on top. Charles O'Bannon, time for three with a miss. If UCLA does not pick up full court, you're not going to build a different tempo. You let the slight clones determine the tempo of the game. Willoughby, four for five from three-point land. And so now it's a 10-point game, Iowa State. We will show you the end of this game tonight here on CBS. Right now, I want to get you back to your game. Kentucky leading 39-27. Thanks for joining Penzo at the half. Enjoy the second half here on CBS. Pennzoil at the half was sponsored by Pennzoil, formulated for today's stop-and-go driving. Stop. Go. Pennzoil. Here they come again. Yep. Sure, a lot of them. Yeah. You know where they're going? Willoughby, off the back rim, rebounded by UCLA, Cameron Dollar. <laughs> One of the biggest stops in the game for uh, Iowa State if they can get it. Cole Cato for stepping in on J.R. Henderson. Henderson will go to the free throw line again. Third personal on Kelvin Cato. 4-12 to go. Eight team foul. One and one for Henderson. J.R. Henderson at the line with 4-12 to go. Makes it a two-point game, UCLA. They were down by 16 points to the six seeds from Iowa State. In the Big 12, Anderson in a one-on-one -on -one has another shot coming. Seems that Coach Steve Lavin put excitement into him and also put semi-pressure up court, which got him back into the ball game. There's a fast attempt in the second half. Anderson misses the second. UCLA shoots at 52%. They were as low as 35 in this game, or up in the 40s now, making their comeback. Two-point lead, 4.02 to go. This is Holloway. Holloway, Bankhead, Pratt, Cato, and Willoughby, the lineup for Iowa State. A foul away from the ball, I believe, Henderson. Henderson, I think, got a, a piece of Willoughby. 
That's four on him. Bailey has four. McCoy and Dollar have three each for UCLA with 3.57 to go. Clay Edwards comes into the game. And Cato goes out for Iowa State. Willoughby will be shooting two as the Bruins are into the double bonus. Willoughby with 26 points in this game, burying them from three-point range. He's got six from three-point range in this game. Makes the first and tie it with this one. He's the one that makes the team go. Can hit from three-point land. He can score off the dribble penetrating. And 82% from the line. And he makes a pair. We have a tie again at 3.57 to go. Second half, UCLA and Iowa State. The Alamo, the real thing here in San Antonio, Texas. We're inside at the Alamo Dome where it's a tie game, 3.57 to go. Tim Ryan and Al McGuire, we've had five lead changes and four ties. And we had a 16-point lead by Iowa State in this game. UCLA had 25 points in the first half, and they've got 33 already, with nearly four minutes still to go in the second. Iowa State has not scored a field goal in about four minutes. Right now, they just want to stay close and maybe win it at the end. Bruins with the ball. Cameron Dollar sets it up. Chris Johnson back in the lineup. O'Bannon. Henderson got stepped on. He's limping around. Can't move very well. Dollar now goes to Henderson. Henderson inside for Bailey. Good ball movement. Good spacing. Excellent play call by Steve Lavin. 11 points for Toby Bailey, two-point UCLA lead. Holloway, Pratt, Willoughby, Edwards, and Bankhead. The lineup for the Cyclone. I'd get the ball to Pratt down low now and spot up Willoughby. 12 seconds on the shot clock, under 10 now. Willoughby looking for the play, goes inside to Pratt. Back to Willoughby, Willoughby's three-point try, yes. It's a Pratt Willoughby game on one end, and this other end down here is really O'Bannon and Henderson and uh, Dollar. Seven three pointers for Dedrick Willoughby in a one point Iowa State lead. Bailey. Chris Johnson, Cameron Dollar. Inside for O'Bannon, broken up. Turnover Bruins. All the way to Pratt. Bankhead. 10 turnovers by UCLA. Willoughby in the trap. Timeout called by Tim Floyd at 20 with 2.19 on the clock. Cyclones by a point, 61 to 60 with 2.19 to go. Minnesota advanced earlier with a win over Clemson in double overtime. Clemson gave them all they could handle. Minnesota lost a 15-point lead. Had to go all the way into the second overtime. And now they await the winner of this game where they will meet Saturday at 3.40 Eastern time in the Elite Eight Regional Final. Team fouls now UCLA with 11, Iowa State with eight. And uh, they have used their 220s. Tim Floyd just taking a 20 there. 2.16 and counting down. Iowa State by a point. They don't have a full clock. There's only 15 left. Willoughby, double team, gets it off to Pratt. Back to Willoughby, now this is Holloway. Holloway found an opening, didn't go for him. Cato missed the follow, rebound Bailey. UCLA ball, 150 to go, trailing by one. Ed O'Bannon time, Tim. I get it to Ed down low. UCLA scores 80 points a game. They're not going to reach that. It does not appear. 135 to go. That was Dollar. 
One point, Bruin lead, 16 points for Cameron Dowler, the senior guard. Holloway. Watched by Bailey inside to Cato. Cato over Henderson, won't drop for him. Dollar rebounding. And as usual, the senior guard steps up with key plays at both ends of the court. He's their leader, welcomes the roll. They take a 20. 57.4 seconds left. A one-point Bruin lead. The Bruins, who score 80.4 a game, shoot at 52%. Had their problems here against Iowa State. And this is a long way from over with a one-point game. 57.4 remaining. Bruins will have the ball when we return. Tim Ryan, Al McGuire back here at the Alado Alamo Dome and UCLA called a 20. It was put in the book over at the scorer's table. And then Steve Lavin wanted it to be a full. If he took the full, he had to lose them both. And that's what happened. So they struck a full from his ledger and a 20. So he's got one full remaining, no 20s. And you can see that the, uh, Iowa State with two and one. Both teams had adequate timeouts in the next 57 seconds that's left to the ball game. Bruins have come back twice from 16-point deficits before. Against Oregon at home at Washington away. So they have the character to do it. They have done it here so far. There is one less than a minute left. One-point lead for the Bruins, 62-61. to 61. They were down 16 in this game. This Cameron Dollar won't let them lose. He's the fellow that kept them in this game. 24 on the shot clock when they came back on the floor. It's now down to 12. Bailey inside to Henderson. Back for Bailey. Johnson over to Dollar. Dollar hits. He's had all the important points and plays in this game, bringing the Bruins back. 64 to 61. What a close clutch play. He has emotion in this play. He'd go for three-point shot here, I would, and then the foul if they don't hit it. Here's Willoughby, the big three-point shooter hit. How do they let him take that shot? You got to overplay Willoughby no matter where he is. That's the only way they can tie the game. Tied at 64, he's at eight from three-point range. We're going down to the last shot here. They miss it, it's OT. They'll take it a little bit soon, about six, seven seconds, so it'll put back to also win the ball game. There's Dollar again. Travel. He actually stumbled over a foot, it appeared, and gets called for traveling. 1.4 seconds left. We're looking at OT here, firing a miracle. All you're going to see now is an alley-oop pass all the way down court to the foul line, extended down the other end. 1.4 left, tied at 64. Willoughby going to go all the way down. Alley-oop down. Nice play by Charles O'Bannon. Good well, play. I'll tell you what, J.C. Holloway made a good attempt at it. But we're into overtime, the second time tonight here in San Antonio. Now at five minutes to 12, central time in Texas. Here, here, goes, here goes the alley oop pass all the way down the foul line extended. He almost got a piece of potato underneath. That shot, if it had went in, it would have won the ball game. It was a Hail Mary. We'll be right back with overtime. There. So we're into overtime. Earlier, Minnesota had to go two overtimes to hold off Clemson 90 to 84. Exactly. Were the, the, go ahead, Al. Exactly the same play Duke against Kentucky when they threw it down to Christian Leighton and he hit that miracle shot. That's right. Minnesota, in their case, was the one seed playing a six seed, uh, playing a four seed, pardon me, in uh, Clemson. But UCLA, in this case, playing the six seeded Iowa State Cyclones into their first overtime. Henderson he missed as he got bumped looking for a foul, none coming, but a foul called after that. Bankhead picks up his third. Ninth team foul will send O'Bannon to the line. Charles had a solid game. 
one of his biggest assets he has the hops he can really really sky there's the O'Bannon family Mr. and Mrs. Ed O'Bannon <laughs> his dad is shadow shadowing the shot and Charles hits the pair two-point lead UCLA's fourth overtime game this year they're one and two coming into this one J.C. Holloway. Dollar now is playing Willoughby, but didn't get up in time. Willoughby missing that one. Rebound, Bailey. Oh, what a shot from Henderson. J.R. Henderson. He had to adjust in the air. Cato was coming at him. Ten points for him. Four-point UCLA lead. Willoughby for Iowa State has 34 points, 8 of 15 from three-point range. Delta got seven rebounds. Here's Willoughby again. Playing him a little tighter. Bankhead won't go for him. Bailey a good rebound. No basket, that Johnson. was a charge. That's wiped out. Charging call against Chris Johnson, his first personal. Here he is, that called the charge, he goes right into the man. The man was in defensive position, both feet down and facing the defensive man. Good call. I think they got to get the ball to Pratt, down low. Got to get it to him now. 3.45 to go in the first Here he goes. Time. Here's Pratt, and Pratt, who can just... Climb up the ladder there. Goes over the taller Henderson. 13 points for him. Now you got to penetrate and kick off or drop off and take it all the way yourself. So go Bannon. Oh. Bailey on the follow. Tries again and scores. Boy, Bailey showed athletic ability. He missed that first half. But the second one, he just went right back up to the same height again. 13 for him. Finally, the Bruin scoring attack starting to look like it has the last dozen games of the season. Pratt slipped. Diving grab. Good hustle by Bailey, but his body went out of bounds. Bailey went down hard. He's hurting. Here's the turnover. Pratt gets the ball, slips, kicks the ball out. Now Bailey makes a maximum effort. His body slips out of bound, stays with the slight clones. The slight clones also have the arrow, very important in overtime. And Bailey calls a 20. 3.01 to go in the first overtime period. Four point UCLA lead, 70 to 66. Steve Lavin pepping him up. So that what happens in this thing is usually make your first shot then because there's no pressure on it. And one and one that first shot's uh, you kind of tighten up a little bit. Bailey, Dollar, Henderson, O'Bannon, and Chris Johnson for the Bruins. Holloway, Kelvin Cato, Pratt, Bankhead, and Willoughby from Iowa State. Pratt. Willoughby, two points, and oh. followed by Cato. What a tough dunk by Cato that time. Ten points for Cato, perfectly timed, jamming the rebound. Two-point game. What a difference in the first half and the second half that UCLA has played. Looks like a little zone here with overplaying Charles O'Bannon. Looks like a box one, that's what it is. A box one, they're, over, they're playing man-to-man -man on Charles O'Bannon. That's a box they're facing. you got to analyze that. Yeah, they haven't analyzed it. Trying to hammer in against the zone. Bailey missing. Rebounded by Bankhead. They use that against Cincinnati, putting Pratt on 14. Yeah, that was a box one. That means four guys playing the zone and man-to-man -man on Charles O'Bannon. This is Holloway. Pratt's going up. Oh. Pass inside, and Pratt got hit in the head. He's down, and play carries on. Here's oh. Henderson. Now they'll, the now, now they'll call it. They have to let the play end, Tim, on something like that. 141 still to go. Pratt got hit in the face. We're not sure exactly where. We'll take a look at the replay here. Henderson with 12 points has the Bruins up by four. Now watch Pratt. Oh, Let's boy. See. Got a nice elbow by Charles O'Bannon in the head. Yep. O'Bannon uh, reaching in. 
try and grab the ball there. Watch it again. Obviously, it wasn't intentional. See him double teaming right away down on him. Now, the refs have to let the play go because UCLA has the numbers on the fast break. The second they scored, they called the medical timeout, if you want to call it, or their timeout. It's now they're going to have to take him out of the game, I believe. He can come back in, but they have to take him out of the game. Yeah, it looked like his uh, elbow landed right on his temple as it was kind of a stunning tight blow. That's the way he went down. Looking a little uh, dizzy right now. The doctor on the floor checking him out. 13 points for Pratt. Six rebound. And they don't want to be without him in this critical time. 1.41 to go. They already made the substitution, but the next uh, dead clock, he'll be back in. Pratt goes to the bench. Clay Edwards comes on the floor for the Cyclone. UCLA by four, 141 to go. Tough loss for Iowa State having Pratt on the bench. Looks like he was just stunned by that blow to the head. It's here to strike him out on the temple. Play Edwards, and he hits. So Edwards comes in for Pratt, delivers right away. Two-point game. It was Edwards who got the winner against Cincinnati in round two of the tournament. They're still in the box one. Playing Charles O'Bannon, man to man. You see it on your screen. You're open there. You got to take it, Johnson. Chris Johnson in and out. Battle for the rebound, and Edwards comes away with it over Henderson. 103 to go. Ball in the hands of Willoughby. Going for three. Off the front iron. Grazed at Henderson. Rebound. Wow, did the Bruins dodge a bullet at that time? That three was right there. Under a minute we go. Dollar with the ball. Bruins with a lead. Going to work the clock down. The number two seeds trying to get to Minnesota, the number one seeds. There's 15 seconds spread between the shot clock and the game clock. So even if UCLA scores a two-pointer here, Iowa State can still win with a three, but nope. Bailey's pass for Johnson off the mark, out of bounds. Pratt should get back in. Yes, here he comes. They got to put Pratt in. Excellent move. Kenny Pratt comes back in. May still be a little groggy, but see him just stretching out his jaw muscle there. 24.3 seconds left. Iowa State ball on the missed cue by the Bruins. If Iowa State is trapped, they'll automatically call a timeout. Holloway in charge. Pratt's going to get the ball, and he's going to do his thing. Foul before the shot went up. Three on O'Bannon. Charles O'Bannon. Pratt shoots 64% from the foul line. 12.5 seconds left. Two shots for Pratt. Can tie it up again. We had double overtime earlier when Minnesota ousted Clemson after a real, real dogfight. Pratt is one of four from the free throw line tonight. He's a JUCO transfer out of Utah. And his home is shy. Ooh, he hit a big one. Huge. Woo. 14 points for Kenny Pratt. Shaking off that blow to the head. If he misses this, Tim, they'll foul immediately if he misses it. Try not to have any ticks off the clock. He does. Ooh, he walks. Oh, my goodness. Charles O'Bannon. He didn't know, but Charles Johnson. O'Bannon and Johnson both had the ball. That's what created the walk. I think you'll see that in the replay. A huge turnover there. 11.1 to go. One point game, UCLA. Cyclones have the ball in Bruin territory. Alley up the break into Bankhead. Bankhead hit the alley up. There's seven seconds. Let's see what happens. All the way, Dollar. One point game. It's Dollar up and in. Oh, wow. 1.9. Wow. Cameron Dollar. Holy mackerel. What a game. Cameron Dollar with 1.9 left as the Bruins in front again by one. UCLA leads by a point, and here's why. With 1.9 left, watch Cameron Dollar, number five. 
drives the lane and makes the shot down to 1.9 to send UCLA back in front by a point. Bank had just sent Iowa State into the lead by a point. And Cameron Dollar now with a career high 20 points in this game has been the critical player at the critical times throughout this second half. Remember, UCLA was down by 16. Now the same play all the way down. Alley oop all the way down. You gotta throw it high and down. Hey son, you only got five seconds. Get the ball in. What are you doing? Clay Edwards, the sophomore from Morning Sun, Iowa, just seemed to lose track of the fact he only had five seconds to make that pass. I was wondering what he was doing. He was going back and forth, and it was just a mental mistake. Now the odds are against. Iowa State scoring 1.9 uh, seconds left, but they would have had a chance. Well, and they came close the last time he made the pass down court off of Blue and Hand. Balls in, has the ball. game's over. And that is it. The Bruins have survived the challenge of Iowa State and are into the Elite Eight. They will meet Minnesota for the regional championship here in the Midwest on Saturday here on CBS. What an effort by the Cyclones of Iowa State. Willoughby turned in a 34-point game, eight three-pointers. But it was Cameron Dollar, the hero for the Bruins. Here's the last play, and it's in the hands of Cameron Dollar as time expires. Memories of Tyus Edney winning in the final seconds against Missouri two years ago. And Minnesota meets UCLA one against two Saturday at 3.40 Eastern time into the Elite Eight for the regional championship in the Midwest. Chevrolet players of the game, easy choice is Willoughby, 34 points, 8 of 17 from three-point range. Cameron Dollar, a brilliant game for the Bruins, bringing them back from 16 down. He had a 20-point night, his career high, 9 of 14, including the winning basket. And we'll be back here at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. And right now, we'll take you to Pat O'Brien after these messages. All right on CBS, your late local news, followed by The Late Show with David Letterman. Dave's special guests tonight include Dennis Leary, Bridget All, and the musical group Toad the Wet Sprocket. Great group. That's coming up tonight on CBS. Our coverage of the regional semifinals tomorrow beginning at, we'll be here at 7.30 Eastern time. Texas and Louisville, Arizona, number one Kansas out in the southeast. Cal and North Carolina, and Chattanooga and Providence, our Cinderella game. Let's go back to San Antonio. And Al McGuire, Al, you're on. Uh, thank you, Pat. Coach, what did you adjust for the second half? The first half, you were just terrible. Well, it reminded us a lot of the Princeton game. Uh, the players were discouraged. They were frustrated. Uh, the Princeton got, game last year where you lost in the yeah, first yeah. round of the NCAA. Yes, we got in a rut. Uh, the tempo was to their liking. They got us a deliberate half-court game, and we need to speed things up. So we started trapping and pressing and getting up-tempo more to our liking. I, I thought you did a tremendous job in the second half, Coach. Congratulations. Do you have any problems facing Minnesota? you just pleased to face them, I guess. Yeah, we're just happy to be there. This whole season's been about overcoming adversity, overcoming hurdles. I can't be happier for this group of kids. Their character, their ability to fight back all year long under these circumstances is unbelievable. You look like Pat Rowley with that hairdo. Not anymore. I'll tell you, it's been a rough year. Krzyzewski, Lon Kruger, Denny Crum. Okay, I now Tim love Ford. you, Coach. I got to get on to Cameron Dollar here. Outstanding. Cameron, you're unbelievable. What were you thinking about when you made that last shot? I was really just trying to just compete all the way through. I mean, um, all year long, we've been trying to work on being consistent over a 40-minute period. And, I mean, I just thank Jesus that I was able to do it today. Listen, you wouldn't let the team lose, but what did the coach, you told me to ask you, that? what did the coach say to you guys at halftime? Did he rip into you? No, he just told us just to continue to play. I mean, don't get discouraged. Just continue to press on and do the things that we have been doing to, the, to get where we're at right now. I mean, all year long, we've had a lot of adversity. A lot of bad things that have happened in our program, and we just continue to battle through and fight through, and that's one of the things that he tried to encourage us to do at halftime. Well, you're a champ, son. Congratulations. Back to you, my man, Pat. All right, Al, thank you very much. Good job. UCLA prevails 74-73. What can we say about this? But how similar was this to Tyus Edney a couple of years ago, Clark Kellogg, where he went rack to rack. He certainly did it. 16, knocked out last year in the first round by Tulsa. They don't want to lose this one. Edney going the distance. Yes! 
funny how history repeats itself every now and then in this tournament, and we saw a lot of great baskets and tremendous games tonight. We'll be back to wrap it up all up for you from New York here right after this. Stay with us. Tonight, great basketball. I mean, we had a great time watching this. Hope you did as well. How are the overtimes going to affect these teams now, Mike? I think it takes tension off. It gives them a little bit of a more uplifting. And, and for the four teams who lost, please don't anyone call them losers because they're, they were great competitors tonight. Eric Harris has a separated shoulder, we're hearing now, from Minnesota. And Clem Haskins says this could cost them a national title. It, it would be a severe loss to him if he's out. But go back to your original question about how will it affect UCLA. I don't think it'll affect them at all. Their biological clock is still on West Coast time. It's 10.30 in the West Coast right now. And I think we all agree what we saw tonight was guys willing to take the big shot, right? That's yeah, I really like to see marquee guys step up, go high profile and high power. You saw that across the board. Tonight. All right, tomorrow night here on CBS, more marquee names uh, coming up. Texas and Louisville. We start at 7.30. That tips at 7.39. Then Arizona and Kansas, the number one seed in the Southeast. Kansas, the most dominant team in the tournament. And Cal, North Carolina, and Chattanooga and Providence, our Cinderella game. We can't tell you how much we enjoyed watching these games. We hope you did at home as well. And uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you a little later today in the East Coast and tomorrow on the West Coast. Good night. Be careful. So long, everybody. says I've got to go man to man so he gets out of the zone now with Kansas having to chase the fatigue situation is one that you have to favor Arizona here four minutes remaining Dickerson on a ball. There's just so much tension oh, you it seems feel. around the Kansas team. They're not getting the, the rebound, the loose ball, and a timeout on the floor. The under four timeout. Arizona stunning Kansas at the moment. You try to break it down why Arizona's in front. Billy, look at the turnover department. Turnovers and really steals as well, Jim. Yeah. Arizona with their great quickness has created turnovers with tremendous ability to steal and Pollard no points in the ball game Arizona has 12 steals in this game Pollard's uh, only attempted one shot and Jim what it is is a matter of one coach getting the style that he wanted and another one not being able to get the production of the power game that Kansas needed so quickness over power in this ball game example the French with his third block in the last minute on the game clock You see another block. Jim, the all-time record for steals in this region is by the team playing the next game. Providence has 19 steals. Bibby with a three. Providence had 19 steals against Austin T back in 87. 13-point lead with 315 remaining. And Pierce tries to make a statement and wake up the Jayhawks here with the fast approaching three minute mark. How about Bibby recognized the double team, got rid of it before the double team could react. He's playing a great game. Timeout by Simon. That's Better than throwing it away. That's twice he's done that. He's utilized the timeout and stuck on the sideline. A 20. 75-64, tell me how you get back in the game 11 down. Well, if you're Roy Williams now, you've got to be thinking about the outside game. Pound it inside and pump the ball back out for three. I mean, if you're down 11, you've got to show some outside ability to score from the outside. Thomas, can he hit some? Jared Haas hasn't been able to go, Jim. We can see that it's evident he can't go with his wrist, so it's going to have to be Billy Thomas, Ryan Robertson, maybe Paul Pierce out there, Vaughn penetrating and kicking out. Pollard has come up with, with nothing here for them on the inside. Timeout. Simon again calls a timeout. Bad screening by Arizona not to open up Bibby. That's a full one. 
Leaves Arizona with one full timeout, no 20s. We'll be right back. With an 11-point lead and the ball. Jim, Kansas is not guarding the man taking the ball out of bounds, Simon. So therefore, there's an extra player here on the screening. Davison comes back. Nice job. Dickerson almost lost it. Kansas is going to chase, get the ball in the hands of Simon misses the play in, and here comes Kansas. They absolutely there, Billy. Dared him to come inside, and he missed the shot. Robertson, much needed three, drops, and it's down to eight with a timeout, Kansas. Robertson, an excellent shooter from the outside. And Jim, what I was going to say, get the ball in the hands of Bibby if you're Arizona the rest of the way. Robertson, after the team had missed nine in a row from three-point land, gives him some hope with 2.31 remaining. Just a 20-second timeout. And, and Jim, what happened here is that Kansas showed that they're going to chase in a half-court set. You get the ball in Bibby's hands, tell Dickerson to stay loose on that baseline. Bibby will get him the ball. They come back with Terry, so Lute Olsen counters by putting two of his point guards in the game at the same time. Inbound Dickerson. Dickerson ahead, wide open, Bramlett. And one! LaFrance picks up his fourth. Great look ahead by Dickerson. Bramlett made eye contact and took off. Kansas took the gamble, and it didn't work for him. Kansas foul on the 45. Now notice what Lute Olsen is doing. He's substituting offense for defense. He wants to have the two guards out there, Terry, and Bibby on offense. Four on LaFrance. Bramlett with 12 points, 12 rebounds. A young man whose whole attitude seemed to change about three weeks ago in a practice when he shattered the backboard. A actually suffered uh, cuts in the arm, had six stitches, but they say he hasn't been the same guy. It's been a wake-up call for him. He's having a huge NCAA tournament. Yeah, I'll give him a lot of credit, too, that won't show up in the stats. And what he's done down inside defensively on LaFrance. He's had a great defensive game. Vaughn got it up to the corner, but first the whistle. You can see what Kansas is going to do. Put the ball in Vaughn's hand, have him penetrate and kick out to Robertson or to Thomas. Dickerson second. Again, it's two the rest of the way for Kansas. 209 remaining. And Jim, remember another thing. Taking that ball out of bounds, uh, we had a situation where Arizona wasted two 20-second timeouts. They only have one full left. Meanwhile, Kansas has two full ones and a 20. Huge free throws. He hit two huge free throws last year to seal the victory against Arizona in the final nine seconds, just to get it to eight. And it's going to be a full court press here. Well, LaFrance has got to be careful because Bramlett's quicker than he is if he goes long again. Bibby split between the two defenders. Not many guys can split a double with Vaughn involved. Two minutes, two minutes remaining. And they're going to make him chase, and you know how hard these guys have worked tonight from the standpoint of being tired. They fouled Simon outside. Let's see who they call it on. It's going to be Billy Thomas. So Jim, as a team, Arizona only shoots 64%. Simon, 67%. Uh, excuse me, 77%. So one of the better free throw shooters. And it's one and one for the last time. After this one, it'll be two the rest of the way. Yesterday, we watched some teams practice with the big ball, shooting free throws. <laughs> that was Chattanooga. Yeah, yeah, you can watch all different kinds of techniques. Comes down here, it's a matter of having the guts to make them, and Simon does it. 150 remaining. Arizona up 10. I can't believe Vaughn gave up that ball. Robertson, hard earned to inside, timeout. 
Timeout called by Kansas with 140 remaining. Now down to eight, Jim. A stop here, and you've got three possessions to get yourself back in there. You're Roy Williams now. You have to start playing the game of arithmetic. It's a full timeout. 79-71, 140 remaining. Billy, I keep thinking back to, as we look at the reset here, it's double bonus the rest of the way with the arrow belonging to Arizona. Two years ago tonight, you and I were at Kemper Arena at Kansas City. Kansas was the one seed taking on a Virginia. Virginia team that was a heavy underdog. And it was a, a, a big upset that night by the Cavaliers. Here they go long to Dickerson. Pierce put his Great hand up. effort by Pierce. That was a track meet. Vaughn, LaFrance tips it in, it's down to six. And again, the timeout by Kansas, a 20. How about the effort by Pierce and LaFrance on those two plays? First Pierce, the only chance he had was just to hope his hand was somewhere in the area. Now, Dickerson had him beat by about three steps. Pierce just put those long arms up there. There's LaFrance setting the screen for Vaughn. Bramlett, who's been all over the place defensively today, Comes over to help out, and that allowed LaFrance for the tap-in. Kansas has cut it to six with 1.31 remaining. Pierce steals it again. I don't know why Arizona is trying to go for the home run. All, what they want is to use some clock. They don't need the points. Being very careless. 112 remaining. This was a 13-point lead just two minutes ago. Every possession must count, must end in a score. Thomas with a three. And a timeout called by Vaughn. The last Jayhawk timeout. Why did Bibby leave the double team Vaughn to leave Thomas wide open in the corner? You'll see right here, you'll notice how Bibby came over to help out, left Thomas wide open. In two minutes, they've cut it from 13 to 3. We'll be right back to Birmingham. Roy Williams with 101 remaining. Jim, we talked about the exuberance of youth trying to go for home runs and the maturity of the older player now being more solid. That exuberance for going for that long ball really cost Arizona twice. Can they get it in bounds? Arizona has a full timeout. That's the only timeout for either team. M mismatch here, Pearson Bibby. Not what Kansas wants. Bibby takes the shot. Uh, put him up by five. Big mistake by Kansas in having Pierce on him. Thomas, can he do it again? Yes! It's down to two. Kansas can't stop the clock. They need to get the ball in the hands of Bibby again, does Terry. Terry almost tied up, and they call a foul on Robertson. Jimmy, Bibby has got to come back for the ball. And Lute Olsen is talking to the young man on the sidelines right now, and I guarantee he's telling him, you get back here and get the ball. A 70% free throw shooter going to the line for two. How about Billy Thomas coming off the bench and hitting a pair of threes? You know what helps him, Jim? He does, he does not now have time to think about the shot. Everything is going strictly on adrenaline, adrenaline and he's got the good stroke. That makes it a three-point game. But still, this is the big one to make it a two-possession game. Well, you can go for two here. You don't need to go for the three. Let's see what Jock Vaughn does. He needs to keep the ball in his hands. I can't believe he's giving it up. Robertson watching. Hitting the three. It's down the one. 21 seconds. And Bibby will go to the line. How about this display by Kansas? Voted number one. Other than the overtime loss to Missouri, this team would have been undefeated. Showing some guts here. 
And Bibby, who has been sensational, now has to go on that line. The biggest free throws of his life. He'll shoot two. Got that one. How about the way he's just stepping right up there, settling those knees down, eyes riveted to the rim. Kansas will need a three Big to tie time. it. Big time gut free throws there. Kansas has hit four straight three-pointers. This one to tie it. Thomas. Long rebound, Vaughn. Gives it up to Robertson. Five seconds. LaFrance has to go outside for overtime. Arizona has pulled off the biggest upset of this tournament. couldn't find it. Somehow it landed in the arms of Vaughn, who gave it up to Robertson. A floating three-pointer comes up short. LaFrance knew he had to take it to the corner, but doesn't connect. And with all due respect to the Coppin States and Chattanoogas, who have pulled off major surprises in this tournament, virtually no one in the land had Kansas going out anywhere short of the Final Four. But Arizona has pulled off the shocker in Birmingham. A team without a senior in its first nine players has beaten a team that just seemed destined for a national championship. Kansas, this one will linger. The pain will not go away for a long, long time. Arizona will play Sunday for the right to go to the Final Four. They'll play the winner of Chattanooga and Providence, which is coming up next. Mike Bibby is the Chevrolet player of the game for the Wildcats and Paul Pierce for the Kansas Jayhawks. There is a, an air of disbelief in Birmingham as Kansas is eliminated in the Sweet 16 round. Pat O'Brien coming up next. Around the 10 o'clock hour now here in New York City, and the most dominant basketball team in the country has gone down to Arizona. Let's send you right back out to Birmingham with Billy Packer and Lou Olson. Lute, that has to be one of the great wins of all time. You've had so many, and you've been so successful over the years. Your kids were awesome tonight. Well, I thought they were. They, uh, the, the thing I loved about them all week long was their attitude. It's like, hey, you think we're in awe of them? We're not in awe of anybody. We're going to come out. If they're going to beat us, they're going to have to beat us out in the court. And I thought that attitude showed all night long. With well, it was interesting to me when your kids were shooting around. Kansas was very stern. Your guys were smiling. It's like, hey, we belong here. We're not chopped liver. No, exactly. And, and you know, it's so great for these kids because we've, you know, we've had some people refer to them as chokers and all of that kind of thing. I mean, this is a group without a senior, and they just come out and bust their butt all the time. I'm, I'm just so proud of them. I, I, can't, I can't tell you. They came out. They 
J.J. Bramlett was not going to give an inch on the boards. I thought Mike Bibby was outstanding in that point guard position. Miles Simon showed the senior leadership or junior leadership that we need. Hey, Dickerson's not so easy to match no. up with either, is he? No, he's not. He had a great first half. He didn't shoot it well the second half, but uh, he, he creates a lot of problems for people. You know, one of the things, and this is almost getting like a packed in postseason tournament now, but Coach Wooden always used to say, always take quickness over size, and tonight that was really an example, wasn't it? Yeah, we had great quickness. Uh, they hurt us some with the size, but I was really proud of our guys in terms of in the post. Boy, they didn't, the, the Kansas guys had to come down and work their tail off to get the ball in there, and I thought I thought maybe that helped wear them down a little bit. People were saying they wear, wear us down. I didn't think that was the case. I thought we were fresher at the end. We'll call it an upset. You'll say it's what you expected. Well, Congratulations. Go to get to your club. Congratulations. Nice going, Luke. Thank you. Pat, back to you. All right, Billy, thank you. So here's why George Rabbling doesn't have the problem you have. His brackets are laminated. So he can't rip them up or anything. He just uh, sets them up. But what was the difference today for Arizona? Well, in my op opinion, a hidden factor in this game was Arizona's post defense. What they did is they put a blanket, Clark, over LaFrance and Pollard. Combined 14 points. Pollard goes zip. Yeah, and he got in foul trouble early, but again, the team speed, Billy mentioned that in the interview, that was one of the dominating factors in this game, and then tremendous perimeter play and being even on the backboards with Let's Kansas. talk about Roy Williams for a moment. Eight tournaments, no national titles. The Jayhawks had three one seeds, three two seeds, three and a four seed under him and no titles. Well, when you talk about the matchups and you get to the Sweet 16, you have to look at the matchups. Arizona did what they needed to do to handle a team that was a little bigger and deeper. A great game, and you got to hand it to those kids at Arizona, huh? Yeah, they made a lot of big basketball plays, screens, loose balls, extra passes, but Kansas went down as champions. They played a marvelous game, and they showed their heart at the end. Kansas and Roy Williams had a great season, 34 and 2 on the season. Coming up later tonight now, uh, just momentarily, actually, in a few minutes, Cal and North Carolina. That is at 10:16. That's a hard time. We'll be sending those of you expecting Chattanooga and Providence. We'll start you at Cal and North Carolina, then we'll get you to your game, the tips, at 10:24. We'll come back to committee in New York after this. <laughs> Welcome back. North Carolina is the number one seed and is unbeaten since late January. But as Andrea Joyce reports, this was anything but a typical Tar Heel season. It is a familiar sight. North Carolina in the Sweet 16, just where they've been now 15 of the last 17 years. The surprise is how they got here. After a shocking 0-3 ACC start, the Tar Heels wondered if they'd even make it to the tournament at all. The media was writing things in the paper, you know, Dean Smith is not at the top of his game, you know, Carolina basketball is at the ultimate low, and, you know, it definitely, it hurt us a whole lot. You know, things was, just wasn't going right for the team, we wasn't playing together, and people, people was getting frustrated. frustrated. We was just, you know, why are we even playing basketball, you know, it's to the, it was, it was that bad. After that third ACC loss at Virginia, the Tar Heels held a players-only meeting in the visitors' locker room. The atmosphere was emotional as the team set out to change the course of the season. Everybody, you know, was upset and everybody got to say things and get things off their chest. It wasn't, you know, pointing a finger at each other. It was more, you know, it's showing how you feel. Everybody was on the same page after we left that meeting. Everybody was willing to give 150% in practice and try to apply that to the games that we were going to play. In the very next game against NC State, the Tar Heels found themselves down by nine with less than two minutes to go. Miraculously, they eked out a victory. There he is, side of Jamison. It was the first step in the incredible North Carolina turnaround. I think it was a gradual confidence uh, that came from uh, winning barely at state. We started winning ball games and we started finding the chemistry and we started coming together as a, as a team. And, and once you got that and all the egos aside, you know, it began to be a lot more fun also. The refocused Tar Heels improved dramatically, maturing with every game. And now, as improbable as it may have seemed, North Carolina is a national championship contender. So if somebody would have told you in December that you'd be undefeated in February and March. Well, no one would believe 
that. No basketball person, not even the dearest North Carolina fan would go along with that one. And they're playing on Frenetic Friday here in the tournament. We'll find out what happens. The games are coming up. Regional game two all set to begin as North Carolina, the number one seed, they're ready to take on the number five seeded California Golden Bears. And a look at our brackets. Louisville going on to beat Texas 78-63. They await the winner of this game. Evening, everybody. Welcome back to Syracuse. I'm Gus Johnson as California and North Carolina are all set to face each other for the third time in their history. And Dean Smith and the Tar Heels, they're coming off a magical moment in Winston-Salem in the last round. Carolina beating Colorado 73-56. Dean Smith becoming the winningest coach of all time with win number 877. But with the record already behind them when they're ready to focus on getting to the national championship and they're doing a great job this year with two young players Eddie Cota a freshman and Antoine Jameson a sophomore and yeah, that says something about the team they're a young team so experience has got to be a factor or a concern anyway and Jameson you've got a guy that is quick around the basket strong and gets to the ball very well for them as you see what his numbers look like and Ed Cota you have a young man that really runs the offense for them has turned himself around in the team because his defense has become much better. His assist to turnover ratio has also improved. This team feels like they can go a long way when those two guys play strong. And for California, they received a tough break when Ed Gray, their leading scorer, averaging 24 points a game, went out at the end of the season with a broken foot. But this young man, a tight end on the football team, has really stepped up in his place. He has been very strong, and the thing that he's done most is you look, his numbers is almost three times what they were at the beginning of the year as you take a look at what he's done in the tournament and that's what made him so strong but additionally he played against Tim Thomas from Villanova shut him out offensively in the second half that's how the Cal Bears get here playing in the Sweet 16 against this North Carolina Tar Heel team and the starting lineups for California they've started at least four seniors in the lineup all season long and they've started five 11 times four in the lineup this time Tony Gonzalez the junior and for Carolina Williams Carter's wicker Okalaja and Antoine Jameson and the head coach for Cal Ben Braun in his first year coming over from Eastern Michigan the 1997 back 10 coach of the year his 20th year as a head coach and the officials Jim Burr Mike Foote and Paul Jansen and we're underway in game number two California in gold Carolina in the white uniforms I expect this to be a game a little bit of a plotting game if you will and by that I mean that I think that California will be very patient because they know that they have leadership and experience in their favor try to go inside to get some points here's Stewart Drop step on the baseline, and he hit the short jump shot. And I think the physical play is going to be what makes the de determination whether or not Carolina will step up and be as aggressive physically as I'm sure Cal will be. Rebounding a very big key in this game. Jamison squaring up, and he'll get the roll. I think that's his shot, but that's what he's got to extend. He's got great skills around the basket. He's got to extend that out to about 17 feet, but he's very capable of making the one that he just took. Jamison, sophomore from Charlotte, first team, all ACC as a sophomore, and a turnover against the Bears. And Dean Smith, truly a legend in college basketball, his 36th season, the all-time winningest coach in college basketball history with 877 wins. Because I played for Coach Smith on the Olympic team. He's just unassuming about anything that's not team oriented as anybody I've ever been involved with. There's a block shot, Stewart. Nice touch pass, duck to the basket. Rigsby, rebound inside, is follow too strong. Good, good defense by uh, Serge Schwicker. He was there, and that's why that shot wasn't easily, but obviously wasn't made. 
Shamad Williams. Junior from Greenville, South Carolina. Here's Vince Carter. Spotting up for the three, and he buries it. Well, we weren't sure he was going to play. Remember, he hurt, he injured his groin in the last game against Colorado, but obviously he's back playing strong, shooting that right over the top of Duck. Top of the key, Duck to Magruder. Bounce pass inside. Grigsby with Jamison on him. Tries to roll, got it off, and knocked it down. Senior from Houston has battled through all kinds of injuries during his career here at California. Had his jersey retired. Only the second player ever at Cal to have that done. And North Carolina, their road to the Sweet 16. Tough game against Fairfield. And then they defeated Colorado. They rolled on Colorado. Chauncey Phillips and then the Colorado Buffs just didn't have enough. But I think as much as anything, the players from North Carolina wanted to win that game for Dean Smith so they could get it out of the way so they could get to this game and try to put themselves in a position to go to the Final Four. And two quick buckets by Michael Stewart, the senior from Sacramento, California, only averages six points per game on the season. Gus, that tells you what California wants to do. Get it inside. Here's Wicker, back to the basket, fade away. Off the back of the iron, Magruder, long rebound, head of steam. Three. Duck spotting up. And Williams with the rebound. That's it again. One ball. Good call. Was off Sam Jacobson. Timeout. 3.25 to go. 62 to 57. Golden Gophers. McGuire here in San Antonio in the Alamo Dome. Team foul seven apiece. Minnesota's used up their 20s in the timeout. But they have two fulls remaining, and they have the arrow. And there's a little repair going on directly in front of us here. There is a, a covering for uh, some kind of a electrical device, and it has apparently come loose, as you can see. And they are uh, trying to flatten that out to make sure that nobody trips over it. You think they get enough guys stringing that one out? I think so, but it doesn't look like there's a mechanic they, in the bunch. Well, yeah, must, there was one. They must be paid by the hour. <laughs> Here's the foul picture. Henderson has four for UCLA. John Thomas and Jacobson each with four. They have confirmed that fourth foul on Jacobson. 2.27 to go. 66 to 59, a seven-point Minnesota lead. Dollar, O'Bannon, Bailey, Chris Johnson, and Henderson, the lineup for the Bruins. Number two seeds here against number one. O'Bannon, his little runner, and it won't drop. Tip in try by O'Bannon. Toby goes up. Yes! Toby Bailey, who can jump some. 18 for him. And he'll go to the line. Nice drive in the baseline here by Charles O'Bannon. A little push off there. Once, twice, three times, four, and then comes Toby. Finishes up. In. Bailey a chance to make it a three-point play. Cut the margin to four. And he does. 2.13 to go. Only thing Clem Haskins didn't want was a three-point play. Bruins pressing. Jackson quickly down the floor. Jackson won't go for him. Rebounded by Henderson. Remember McCoy out with an injury. Henderson having to do the work on the board. Bailey to O'Bannon. O'Bannon big in. time, big time. Two minutes on the clock. 21 points, Charles O'Bannon. Jacobson, Bobby Jackson in the trap. Drives out of it and he's fouled by Chris Johnson. That's his fourth. Four on Johnson. He joins Henderson with four for the Bruins. In a one and one. Chris Johnson. 145 to play. Last two minutes of the game, Bobby Jackson shoots 69%. In the last two minutes in prime time. So let's see. The Bruins in their 33rd NCAA tournament, 11 time champions. Last year, losers in the first round of Princeton after winning the whole thing the year before. They're both heavyweights. Both have been knocked down. They come back up fighting. Minnesota came back, and now UCLA has come back. Bobby Jackson with 36 points. Clemson now has 11 here. These are the critical ones. Three-point lead. Another shot coming for Jackson. Oh, Takes a routine. Four-point lead, 1.45 to 
43 and counting. Two possession game. Nice switch up high that time. He's doing a simple weave. Bannon in and out. Rebound Lewis. And the sophomore fouled. Looked like Dollar got a hand on him. Three on Cameron Dollar. Now, surprisingly, surprisingly, Tim, in the last two minutes of the game, listen up out there. Quincy Lewis only shoots 44% in the last two minutes of the game from the foul line. When I coached, I always had the foul percentage the last two minutes of the game. I didn't care about the other 38 minutes. Well, but I'll tell you what the other 38 minutes, he's a 60% shooter, and he nails it anyway. <laughs> 14 for Lewis. 69 to 64 with 131 to go. If he makes this, UCLA has to go for three-point shots. Quincy Lewis, 70 to 64, 15 points for him. Dollar started to go the distance and stepped on the inline, evidently, or traveled. Minnesota got to come back and help. Pressure up caught by UCLA. Now the five of them come back to help. Bobby Jackson. There goes Jets. Too much hands. He's out of the game. Chris Johnson goes to the bench. 22nd timeout by UCLA. Five on Chris Johnson, 119 to go. Bobby Jackson gets the inside lane. He's going to blow by you. Chris Jackson had no other choice but to foul him. Now these two seeds really have to show their stuff. Winners of 12 in a row under their rookie coach, Steve Lavin, giving them an impassioned pep talk right now. Johnson on the bench, McCoy out with an injury. And there's plenty of time left, but if, if he makes one of these foul shots, it's a three possession game. They move in Lloyd for three point shooting on UCLA. Clem Haskins is telling his, his club, hey, let's just be steady. I think Clem has underwear older than uh, Steve Lavin. <laughs> <laughs> May well do. His 11th season at Minnesota. He has a fancy mark of 196, 139. Many years at Western Kentucky. He was a big-time pro in the NBA. Played for the Bulls, played for the Suns, and played for the Bullets. Jackson will have two shots in the Super Bonus. Minnesota. That was big. That one was a, was a possession. 71 to 64. Made 11 free throws in a row, including the game against Clemson. Make it 12. He doesn't need 36 points to be a hero in a night. Cameron Dollar. He do. Gets his own rebound and oh. makes the second try. The little guy in all that traffic. The oh. leader of the Bruin team. And they foul Jackson. Almost impossible to get the ball off Bobby Jackson. Four on dollar now. 105 still to go. Watch how uh, well, here, here he is giving the, what I would call the Harlem Gold Trotter move. He keeps the ball alive. He doesn't pick it up. Three guys can't get the ball off him. Jackson with 14 points. Jackson. Talk about a cool customer. Bobby Jackson, the senior from Salisbury, North Carolina. Nails another. 105 for the game. They're back up to three possessions, making that one. That means UCLA has to get the ball three times to win or put the game with the OT. Eight-point lead. Dollar. Minute left. Bailey's pass broken up. Foul called. I was blocked out by the referee, Tim. I didn't see it that time. You had company. We'll wait for the official call. There it is. It's Charles Thomas. His first. Charles Thomas picks up the personal. John Thomas ready to come back in for the Gophers. 58.1 left. Minnesota Golden Gophers top seed in the Midwest, hoping to make it to the final four. A lot of time left. Coach Clem Haskett wants to continue his dream. 
know his father raised 11 children, six, uh, six girls and five boys, and his father never made more than $3,500 a year. I think his first name was Columbus, and he died last May. But Bannon with 22, easy basket for Charles Thomas. That was called by Coach Clem Haskins. 14 for him, it's golden gopher time. Bailey comes back, Cameron Dollar. They gotta shoot from three, they gotta shoot from three. Charles O'Bannon, in and out for him. Minnesota lost the rebound, it'll be Bruin Ball. And they'll get a fresh clock. Shot clock has 32 seconds on it, so maybe they won't get it. There, there it is, 35 seconds. Forty-two point nine. Brandon Lloyd hits a three. The clock automatically stops in the last minute after a made basket. They got a foul immediately. They got a foul immediately. Jacobson comes up with it. I'd have played the clock. Big steal that time by Bobby Jackson. Dollar, huge steal. That is all she wrote. The Big Ten is going to the big dance. Oh, Bannon picks up his third with 21.9 left. We have a timeout with Minnesota's Golden Gophers en route to Indy world's most exciting golfer, Tiger Woods, shoots for golf's greatest honor, a victory at Augusta National, a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. Tim Ryan and Al McGuire in San Antonio, where Minnesota has Bobby Jackson at the line, an eight-point lead, ready to go to Indy. Charles O'Bannon and Quincy Lewis are our Chevrolet players of the game. Quincy Lewis, great job off the bench, 15 points, seven of seven from the line. That's from a 60% shooter. He came up big, the sophomore from Little Rock. Did a great and did it all for UCLA. Everything asked of him. What happens, a great job by Jackson on Cameron Dowling. Bobby Jackson going for 18 points. Another huge night for him, and he finally oh, misses well, one. He misses a shot. 79 to 70. Cameron Dollar. Lloyd, the three-point shooter, is traveled. 18 turnovers by the Bruins. Minnesota can wind it up on this possession. Jackson, three Bruins come to him, and he's fouled. Down to 10.6. Three on Toby Bailey, a gutty Bruin team. They had to battle from 16 back to get into the Elite Eight. Down to Iowa State, pulling it out in overtime by a point Thursday night. But they ran out of gas here against the top seeds from Minnesota. What a job Steve Lavin has done this season. Taking over after Jim Harrop was fired. Regathering his the Strop team taking the big loss on the chin at the hands of Stanford and then getting him here into the Elite Eight. And he's uh, got nothing to weep about, but that's an emotional guy. And he appreciates the effort that this team has given him. Jackson at the line again. Open the 10 point margin. A young man, 32 years of age, got a four year contract. He's a good coach, he'll prove it. Toby Bailey with a step. 4.8. Henderson got a hand on it. 3.9 away from Indianapolis are the Golden Gophers. And there's Clem Haskins. Talk about jobs done. Candidate for Coach of the Year. Already Big Ten Coach of the Year. And the Minnesota fans here in San Antonio are loving it. This is Archambault getting a little time here. The Golden Gophers to the Final Four in Indianapolis. 80 to 72. Minnesota, the first team to make it into the Final Four.
four, Kentucky and Utah coming up. See who goes from the west. There's a guy who had a big game, Courtney James, to Minnesota, and he will be going home to Indianapolis. There's the big man. Oh, man, there'll be more than a home-cooked meal awaiting him. He's going to try to get everybody, all his teammates' tickets to take care of his friends. <laughs> Miles Tarver headed our way, <laughs> and he wants Al McGuire. That's the word for Miles Tarver. He wants Al McGuire. Let's see what happens when we come back to San Antonio. Minnesota is into the Final Four. Great job by UCLA making the Elite Eight, but it is Minnesota's time to shine. Pat O'Brien will be coming up from our studios in New York after this message. We'll be right back. Coming up, Utah and Kentucky at 6 o'clock Eastern time. Let's send you back to San Antonio. We are back in San Antonio with a victorious Minnesota Golden Gophers into the Final Four. Clem Haskin, congratulations. You must feel as young as your players are. I feel great. I'm going to kiss Al right away. Where's Miles Tarver? Where are you? Miles Tarver, what did you look forward to uh, after this game? That's getting down with this man right here. Getting down with this man here. Let's go. All right, let's, let's show some here. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's still got a few more moves than you, Al. Well, Coach uh, Haskins, this has got to be a tremendous thrill for you. What about beating a team like UCLA? They showed so much guts Thursday night. They showed it again here. You know, they showed a lot of guts, a lot of poise. You know, after being down 10 points in the second half, I think it showed what the Gophers are all about. These young men have fought back all year with 31 and 3 for one reason, because it's a very good ball club. They refuse to lose. No question about it. Let's find Quincy Lewis here. We picked up our Chevy player of the game. Hey, Quincy! Great job off the bat. <laughs> Get that hat back there. <laughs> Quincy, unbelievable. Your instant <laughs> offense, but you were more than that today. Well, you know, that's my role. <laughs> you know, your role is to build buildings. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I came up here. I wanted to come play for a great coach. You know, and uh, he just instilled all of us about the team. You know, I said uh, a lot of personal stuff aside just to come off the bench and do what I can. And, you know, hey, this is why we came. We're in the Final Four. He's a better man than he is a coach. Hey, you know it. And that's why we all, that's why every one of us wanted to come play for him. We love him. That's why we're here, because the coach has him. Okay, Tim. All right, it's a trip for Courtney James going home to Indianapolis and taking all of his pals with him. And that's, we'll be going back to Pat O'Brien at our studios in New York after this message. Congratulations to Minnesota. Back in. Damian Dantzler picking up his fourth foul. And Louisville now with three starters in foul trouble. And Tony Williams, the freshman, with three. So Vince Carter, 17 points now. Really stepping up big for the Tar Heels. Just what, what Denny would like to do here is if he can get it keep it the next two minutes and try to keep it below 10, he wants to get DeWan Wheat back in the game because Alvin Sims doesn't see the court quite the way, nor does Sims present the same threat as Wheat and leaving B.J. Flynn open, who was one of the play, obviously, that got Louisville back in good position here. Sims inside, almost threw it away. Nate Johnson off the glass, rims out, knocks out of bounds, and last touch by Louisville. Cardinals have missed their last five shots. Now, don't forget, coming up next, the Southeast Regional Final Providence in Arizona. Five o'clock tip-off time. Got another number 10 seed and the 14 seed. I mean, you, you look at how the tournament has played out. One of the things that I've liked about it is that you can, though the seeds stand up, as a rule, there's always somebody that sneaks in that you don't anticipate. And I like that myst mystical part of the tournament. It's not a lot because you're number one. Jameson, 13 points for him now. Despite playing with the stiff lower back. And it's a 10-point lead once again for North Carolina. They're on a 7-0 run. Well, they've gotten Wheat back in the game. Now, G.J. Flynn has got to find, find some gaps. Dantzler. No way. 
Shaman Williams stepping in, coming up with the steal. Here come the Tar Heels. Williams spots up behind the three-point line. Rebounded by Dantzler. Wheat noticeably limping on that leg now. Yeah, he really doesn't have any, any way to push off. And he created this foul by Shaman Williams here to B.J. Flynn. But Wheat doesn't have the strength because normally he'd have run out in front and gotten himself a layup. He was just fortunate to get down court. Second foul on Shaman Williams. Seven on one, last two minutes and 30 seconds. As Okalaja comes back in the game for Zwicker. This is a good move, I think, by Dean Smith. What he does here is he brings in Okalaja, so the front line is Vince Carter, Okalaja, and Jamison. So he's got offense at all three positions. Tony Williams, baseline, Carter with the board. 37 to play. North Carolina trying to advance to the Final Four for the 11th time under Dean Smith. Nikoda winding up. Long rebound goes to Wheat. They've got to find angles. they got to get open for Juan Wheat because he, he really can't do anything. They haven't made in seven trips down. They haven't made shots. Here's Wheat, 14 on the shot clock. He'll let it go, come up short. Johnson picks it up. B.J. Flynn, open look in the corner, rattles out. You know, the run they made a moment ago, I said to you even in the timeout, I knew they would make another run. The question was not if, whether or not it'd be enough. And it looks like they're really struggling to get the, to grab themselves, regroup, and really get things going again. But you got to credit Carolina for that, too, because they played well in taking that blow. 33 point attempts for Louisville. Shaman Williams, and he doesn't miss too often. Eighteen points for Shaman. Four threes and a timeout on the floor. Called by Louisville. With 4.16 remaining. Well, if North Carolina is a team that can get you a lot of ways. You throw it inside to Vince Carter, who has been tough to guard, but Shimon Williams is a guy you've got to get out and cover. If you don't, he can just drill the three. And because of what happened earlier with the run with Louisville, you see the bench feeling pretty good about their position up 13 with 416. North Carolina going after their fourth NCAA Final Four appearance in the 90s. They've gone each year during odd years here in the 90s. Right now, 79-66. Odd years in the 90s, Carolina, they've been automatic. Winning the championship over Michigan in 93. So on the floor right now for Louisville, Nate Johnson will throw it in bounds with Wheat, Flynn in the backcourt, Sims also in the backcourt for Louisville, and Alex Sanders. Eddie Cota, Shaman Williams, Vince Carter, Zwicker, and Jamison for the Tar Heels. Should Carolina continue to go as they are and they get to the Final Four, this will be the 11th for Dean Smith, which will put him right behind John Wooden, who's at the top of Final Four appearances with 12. Here's Cota. Back it out. Look inside. Jamison, great catch! And that's why he's a second-team All-American. That is a big-time catch, Gus, because the ball was behind him, almost behind his head, and he caught it and was able to control it and get the basket. 3.43 to go. 81-66. Almost a steal by Coda. Here's Sanders. Got it. Sanders is going to make that shot. You don't know if he should be out there shooting it, but he's very comfortable out there. That ends the 12-0 run for North Carolina. Sanders with 17. He had 17 against Texas as well. Gus, this is, this is the 90s version of the four corner. Carolina wisely is going to use as much time as they can. They're looking at 20 on the shot clock, and then they can always go inside. Jamerson can get them something, as well as Vince Carter can break you down. Williams had it stripped. Hung on to it. Bona cross it over. In deep. Nice play by the freshman from Brooklyn. Okay, broke him down. Likes to go left. And then makes this steal. It's Coda to get the hand on him. Here's Williams rejected. 
Dakota right there for the loose chain. Eleven points for Eddie Cota. And North Carolina, they extend their lead up 85-69. 2.41 to go. Five sixty-nine, two forty-one to go. That's Dr. Linnea Smith, the wife of Coach Smith on the left, and his daughter Kristen on the right. High school student. And when you talk about Coach Smith, you have to tell the story about when Chancellor William Acock hired him in June of 1961. He gave him one objective, and that was to give North Carolina a program that they could really be proud of. And as this team prepares to go to its 11th Final Four under Coach Smith, I think Chancellor Aycock, uh, mission accomplished by Coach Smith. Well, they've won the most, he's won more games than anybody in college basketball, so obviously he's done an outstanding job. And having played for him in the Olympic team, Coach Smith is somebody that you, you have to feel good about because he handles, you know, difficult situations. We had a bunch of superstars, if you will, on that team. And what he was able to do was smooth the egos, get everybody to play together on what they said was an undersized team. And so we went on to win the gold medal. So I, I really enjoyed playing for Coach Smith. So Shaman Williams with 18 points so far at the free throw line as North Carolina leads at 85-69. And... Williams shooting 81% from the free throw line. Got the first. And our tournament summary. Minnesota. 16,000 fans greeted them last night when they returned to Minneapolis. As Quinn Buckner told me. And Providence, a number 10 seed, trying to advance to the final four. Gus, there's never been a number 10 seed do that, so they would be the first if they can pull that off. Air ball by Dantzler. Louisville, they were down 21 at halftime. Storm back. Got as close as three. 69-66. But since then, Carolina on an 18-3 run. I tell you when it really turned. When, when B.J. Flynn shot the three-pointer in the corner, because a guard is in the corner and flattened out, he makes the shot, makes the shot. But they push it back up with Vince Carter and get an easy basket. And from there on, there was not much Denny Crum's team could really do to get it going back in their direction. Denny Crum came into this game 6-0 in regional title games. And another look at the Final Four bracket. Minnesota, Kentucky already there. North Carolina will advance. And we are still awaiting the winner of Providence, Arizona. That game coming up next. When you look at, you know, you try to figure out how it's going to go with uh, Kentucky and Minnesota. They've got six common opponents. And instead of naming them, Alabama, Clemson, Purdue, Indiana, Ohio State, and Iowa. Kentucky beat them by plus 18. Minnesota beat them by plus nine. I mean, it, that's that's a little early, and it's, it's just one uh, another way to look at what the possibilities are. But you have to play the game, and I tell you, Minnesota played it strong. But Kentucky, without you know Derek Anderson this year, losing four players to the pros, and going without Allen Edwards, did an outstanding job yesterday. Jamison with the rebound, lead pass, big serve. <laughs> <laughs> the big Go ahead, Serge almost took off too early, and the bitch is just cracking up at him. I don't know how Serge snuck down the floor unnoticed, but he did, and he gives Carolina a 91-69 lead. We got Serge is sneaking. Come on, Serge. Come on, big fella. You can get there. Almost took off too early, but stretched it in. <laughs> the snapback rim helped him a little bit, too. Sir said, I got me one. I got one. Yes. <laughs> oh, you love it for it. I know the guys will be teasing him about that one on the way back to Chapel Hill. So Alvin Sims with 10 points at the free throw line, coming off that career-high 25-point outing. 134 to play between North Carolina and a trip to Indianapolis. So Nate 
Johnson picking up his fifth foul. He will take a seat with 12 points. The freshman from Camden, part of that great Camden connection. Milt Wagner, Billy Thompson. And, and, and that's really what, what it was about. You look there, Nate Johnson is very, very disappointed. I mean, here's a team in Louisville that at the beginning of the year, they weren't even ranked in the top 25, Gus. No one thought that they had much of a chance to, to meld together as a team, principally because their outside shooting was so suspect. Jimmy Crum admitted himself, we can't pass, we can't dribble, we can't shoot, but the guys have found ways, and until uh, the day, they have found ways to win games. They ran into a better Carolina team. Started the season 15-1, and one. subs getting ready to come in for North Carolina. Dean Smith will allow them to step on the floor here at the regional final. So the starters coming out of the lineup, Serge Zwicker, Vince Carter, Shimon Williams, Coda, Antoine Jameson. And here we come, Indianapolis. And they were hanging Dane Smith in effigy during the course of the year, and he's got this group going to the final four. His group has got to be proud as Dewan Week basically looks at his career come to an end here. Dean Smith, 66 years old, his fourth trip in the 90s. They said when they started 0-3 in the conference that the game was starting to pass Coach Smith by. Well, he must have got on the fast train because he caught up with it again. <laughs> I don't know how it passes a guy up when he's winning as many games as Coach Smith is. And the turning point, the NC State game. They were down by nine with 2.09 remaining. Came back and won the basketball game. Their last loss, January 29th to Duke, 73 to 80. And you see Alvin Sims sit down, the gentleman that's sitting to the right of Dean Smith has been with him just about all of his career in North Carolina, Bill Guthridge been a big part of the Carolina tradition and helping him just work with the players. They spend time with people like Serge Schwicker, extra 10 minutes for the big men. You've got to have that kind of support when you're trying to pull it along. And Bill Guthridge has given all the support and loyalty to the Carolina program and Dean Smith. 31 years at North Carolina is Eftimov. Vasco Eftimov, his father plays professional basketball in Bulgaria, had opportunities to go to a number of schools, but dad wanted him to play right here at North Carolina to learn from Coach Smith. A McDonald's All-American. look at the faces on the bench Nate Johnson been a tremendous year for Louisville nobody expected them to get this far I've been on both sides of this I lost as a junior in the final of the regional and I've won so I know exactly what he's feeling I mean it's an empty feeling especially when you kind of accomplish some things no one thought you could accomplish as Louisville has done and then all of a sudden just to see it in one game come to an end but these young men have something to be proud of for the rest of their career because nobody believed in them but them. The tears starting to pour out now for Louisville. Nothing to be ashamed of. A valiant effort by a team with its best player hampered by an ankle injury. Found ways to win all season. Well, three-point attempt by Williams. Well, Gus, as it stands here, this will be the first loss in the regional finals by a Denny Crum coach team. Thirty point six seconds to go. While we were talking about Coach Guthrie, the other guy on that bench is not too bad for North Carolina. Phil Ford as an assistant coach, the original four corners kind of guy. What's happened is at North Carolina, and I know he's as impressed with what his team has done as anybody. Here's Sullivan. Get it up! Get it up! 
Eftimov. <laughs> and he fires an air ball. You got a, you got a chance here. You can see Coach Smith is clapping for him. He likes to see guys who work hard for him in practice get a chance at getting some numbers up here in the regional final. So that's we got three out of four. And the last one's to be seen right after this. And that is the ball game. North Carolina under Dean Smith. They are headed to the final four in Indianapolis. Coach Smith and his team getting ready to compete. Dean Smith now 11 trips to the final four. He's 65 and 26 in NCAA competition. Linnea Smith and their daughter Christine and the final four bracket three teams in one remaining Minnesota Kentucky North Carolina and we still await the winner of the Providence Arizona game that coming up next right here on CBS our most valuable players of the game, B.J. Flynn, 12 points, 4 of 8 from downtown, and Shamond Williams, 22 points and 6 assists. Our final score, 97-74 for Quinn Buckner on Gus Johnson. Coming up next, Pat O'Brien in New York after this break. So three number one seeds in the final four, just the second time since 1979 that three number ones have advanced on. Let's go down on the court with Andrea Joyce and Dean Smith. All right, all right, Pat, thanks. These guys have been trying to get Dean Smith to dance. I'm no Al McGuire, but you're not gonna dance for these guys either, are you? Uh, maybe if we went two more, uh, but really, uh, Louisville had a great comeback. We played very well in the first half, and then, of course, they had the injury, so I'm real proud of the guys, and I know you want to talk to Vince. And some well, I wanted to ask you a question, though. What was going through your mind in the second half, though, when B.J. Flynn was tightening it up, hitting those three-pointers? Well, they made the shots, and they didn't like we just let them shoot, and then uh, they foul us and take away the basket. Sure, I said they could come back and win. It's a... Uh, you know, in the end of the world, but I thought we'd come back. If anybody had told you in January that this was a Final Four team, would you have believed them? No, no way, but they sure have played a lot of heart today, and I'm very proud of them. Congratulations, Coach. We'll see you in Indianapolis. Vince, your coach has said that you guys have had more confidence in this team at times than he has had, but you also were a little worried about being overconfident. How much did that help you, though, to keep focused today? Well, we just went out there and jumped on them um, quickly and just tried to play as hard as we could and tried not to be too overconfident. I think we did a good job of that, and, and it's, it's, it's played off for the whole year. Providence or Arizona, I'll bet you don't care who you play. Um, we don't mind. Uh, we just want to come out and do the same things we've been doing all year and just play hard and, and be proud of what we've gotten. All right, congratulations. We will see you in Indianapolis, and we will send it back to New York after this short break. It's under 20 minutes until we switch out to Birmingham and Providence and Arizona, our final Final Four team for Indianapolis. Earlier, Craig James caught up with Lou Olson and chatted about today's game. Here's how that went. Coach, can you sense the confidence level a little bit higher now that you've got the Kansas victory under your belt? Well, I don't know. Our, our guys were very confident going into the Kansas game, actually, and uh, my biggest concern now is when you have that kind of an emotional win, uh, whether we're in the frame of mind that we need to be in. I, I think the guys have worked hard at it, but it's one thing to work at it, another thing to, uh, to have it happen. So I'm sort of curious to see what happens in the early going as far as whether we've got that snap and the zip that, we've, uh, that we usually have as a team. There'll be a lot of snap and zip from the guards, Sham God and Bibby. Do you see that matchup being a key in the game? Well, there, there are a lot of keys. I think that matchup is certainly a key because we can't, uh, we can't let Sham get into the, uh, into the lane on us like he's gotten against so many people, and he is really quick. Uh, I think uh, Michael Dickerson on, on uh, Brown is going to be very much of a key as well because he, he didn't have a great game the other night. Uh, Brown didn't, but he had a fabulous game against Duke and, and of course, Crozier. Uh, with Bennett Davis and that. So there, there are a lot of keys, probably. I think 
both teams are well balanced. Both teams play very hard, and uh, so it's going to be more than a one or two or three uh, guy game, I think. All right, appreciate you coming by. Good luck. Thanks a lot, Craig. A very confident Lute Olson there talking about his Arizona team, and at 5 o'clock, we'll take you out there and show you that game and one more team to go to Indianapolis. Meantime, in Syracuse, they're cutting down the nets. They seed these for a reason, and three number one seeds are going to the final four. Happened only twice in 79. Dean Smith from 0-3 in ACC play to the final four in 1997, and what a feeling that is, must be, to cut down that net under these circumstances. Clark Kelly, they just have every weapon available today. Yeah, they really do. They've got tremendous balance. They've got great chemistry. They've got size. They've got shooting. They've got defense. They've got the whole package. I mean, they're a tough team to match up with because they can beat you a number of different ways. Well, and also, Mike and Clark, uh, Louisville made a valiant comeback, but when you miss 12 out of your last 14 shots against a team of Carolina's ability, it seals your doom. Every time Louisville did something great, though, Carolina came right back and scored inside. That's a strength of a, of a well-prepared team, and Dean has his team very, very well-prepared. Louisville did make it a game for a while. We have to give Denny some. Well, they made some shots, but again, because of that size difference and that versatility, they were able to withstand the run that Louisville made. So Dean Smith is going to the Final Four one more time. We'll be back with more from the committee here at CBS right after this. Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas have combined for 10 green jackets. Tiger Woods begins his quest for greatness, a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. You know, sometimes some things seem like a good idea when you do it <laughs> until <laughs> you're 45 years old and watching the tapes. And that could have been me somewhere in my college career. Back in Syracuse, they're still celebrating and cutting down the nets and taking it for all it's worth this afternoon because it's a great feeling to be in the Final Four. A lot of hard work goes into this. A lot of hard work goes into getting to the Elite Eight as well. Andrea Joyce is with Denny Crum, who came up short today. Coach, talk to us a little bit about the tremendous second-half effort by your kids to pull it so close. Well, I, I tell you, I couldn't be prouder of them. Uh, we were a little outmanned and uh, got behind, but there's no quit in that bunch. They uh, they gave everything they got, and in the process, I think we kind of ran out of gas at the end there. But but I'm proud of them. They had a great year and uh, far better than anyone expected, I think. And while you're never totally satisfied, uh, I don't really have any complaints. This, this team gave everything they have, and that's all you can ask. I'm very proud of them. How difficult was this day for a kid like Dewan Weed who wanted so desperately to be able to help? Yeah, and you know, I, you talk about courage. I mean, you, he had a bad sprain, he still does, obviously, but he gave everything he had out there and, and obviously wasn't up to par, but uh, doesn't detract from his heart and, and his effort. I think he's, uh, he's a special guy. Thanks for being so gracious. We'll no see you next year. Thanks, Thanks again. Our hats go off to Dewan Wee, too, who played mm -hmm. with that bad ankle. We'll be back with more from New York City in a moment. I hope you're enjoying the games on CBS. One left. Coming up, Providence in Arizona, just shortly here on CBS. And, Mike, uh, Arizona didn't finish the season all that great, but they've got great momentum and confidence in this tournament. They have a lot more confidence in their inside game. A.J. Bramlett is on a roll. 14 rebounds a game in the NCAA tournament. And Providence may be one of the most improved teams here. No question about it. Pac, I think their success evolves around penetration, dribble penetration. They must deny dribble penetration by Arizona, and they must create offensive dribble penetration for them to win. We save you for last. Save me for last. With two evenly matched teams, typically a guy steps out from behind the scenes. Look for Jamel Thomas from Providence. All right, we're going to send you out to the game to Jim Nance, Billy Packer, and Craig James after this message and a word from your local station. We'll see you at halftime. Enjoy it. A symbol for underdog excellence, the glass slipper has become one of the most celebrated traits of the NCAA tournament. Some say to be a Cinderella takes divine guidance or providence. And on Friday night, Pete Gillen's Friars flashed a knowing confidence. A sixth sense that is often a Final Four trademark. 
one of the last teams invited to the party. The Friars are hoping to be the last to leave. Friday, Arizona ripped the air with the tournament's most unexpected triumph. With Lute Olson's guidance, the Young Cats' composure prevailed with a no-look, no-fear attitude. Arizona slammed shut the championship dreams of the Kansas Jayhawks. Both teams have taken their deserving bows. Now they need an encore performance to carry the slipper to Indianapolis. wear it. And welcome to the Cinderella Regional. Some may know it as the Southeast. Calm Regional. down a little bit here. Garces out of the game. Murdoch in for him. This is a small lineup for the Friars. Well, if you're Pete Dillon, you have to use some strategy to turn this around. If you're Lute Olsen, you sit over there and you say, wait a second. I've got a 10-point lead. I've got Bibby getting fresher by the minute. And I'm going to want him out there to control this game the last five minutes. Him God. Well, He'll Dick shoot two. Dickerson has just absolutely great defensive potential. He is so quick, strong, good leaper, but hard he, worker. But he picks up his first. Sham you know, God to shoot two. You notice, Jim, he was right in front of Sham God. There's not many guys his size that could stay right in front of him. Normally, just blow by somebody. Sham God's uh, fortunes turned around somewhat in that loss in overtime to Notre Dame. Bill Walton was there broadcasting the game, and, and Sham God asked him afterwards, have you got any advice for my game? And, and Walton really emphasized the importance of being the point man and playmaker to get the ball to the big guys. Providence people tell you that's been a turning point for him. Listening to the big redhead. Dickerson. Too long. Yeah, he didn't really have that ball set in his hands to shoot it. Okay, it was 12. It's now 8. They can cut into it more. They have two point guards making the play, but Davidson. Yeah. You got the two <laughs> point guards in there with Davidson and Bramlin. And we've got the under eight timeout. 12 point lead down to eight. But Providence must go the rest of the way without its star player, Austin Crozier. A tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. Lute Olsen, the last thing that he wants are fouls. Watch Davidson, how many times he goes up. There was one he put up. This is the final finish, using the left hand so nicely inside. He's been running the court beautifully, and Jim, let's face it, you, you just reeled off his offensive stats, but what's so important, he guarded a man today that could have had the big game and just shut him down, is now sitting on the bench in Crozier. Not the first time that Davidson's done that this season. He also shut down Keith Van Horn in the second half of a the game they play back in December, beating the Utes, holding Van Horn to two second-half points. In roughly 18 minutes of play, so he is certainly capable. You think back at that uh, club in 1988 that had Judd Buechler, who used to do that so effectively, being able to get out there and guard people with size and quickness. Dickerson, ball on the floor, retrieves. Dickerson with back-to-back, -back. Oh, makes. Dickerson now giving his impersonation to Ron Mercer, just going up over the top of people with those short jump shots. He has 10 points, the average is 20. Nice help by Bibby. Pass inside somehow to Brown, timeout Providence. They're down eight with 325 remaining. So, full timeout called by the Friars. Eight down. And we'll be right back. That timeout by Providence, the last one for the Friars. 11 coaches in history have taken two schools to the Final Four. Four of them are active. 
and two of them will be, well, if Lute Olsen hangs on, we could have two of them at the Final Four. Rick Pitino's in. Olsen's already taken two. That's a great trivia question. A lot of people didn't realize you, Durham, backed in the active list from the inactive, going to be coaching at Jacksonville. Dangerous pass. Sham God stole it, but right unable to come up with the pickup. Simon. Dangerous, and dangerous. Sham God run it. Sham God brings it down to six. Three minutes to go. They better put the ball in Vivi's hands and keep it there. Arizona trying to give the West some representation at the final four. And a steal. Garces comes up with it. You've got Sham God and Wright out here. They're causing havoc. Dickerson on him, but he's so tough with that drive. Wright. Punk fake. Thomas three. All there. I think that Thomas, Jim, legs gave out on him. We noticed that in the first half. Just not getting any quick elevation. With Crozier on the bench with five fouls. Thomas. It's got to be Thomas or, or Brown hitting those jumpers. Thomas has put up 22 shots today. He's made seven. 2.30 remaining. Zona by six. James Thomas can't even get any energy to go out and put the pressure on Dickerson. Might not be a bad idea for, for uh, Arizona to put the ball in Dickerson's hands. Thomas just so tired. Simon to the line for two. That's the fourth on Brown. And there's Crozier. Never got to finish that. Uh, here he is. Uh, his hopes resting with his teammates to bring him back. But Crozier was going to UConn. Then UConn gave its last scholarship to Kirk King. So then Crozier called up Notre Dame, said, I'm coming there. They said, we're out of we're out of scholarships. So he went to Providence without even visiting the school. Now, without being on the floor in his senior season, he'd like to somehow find a way to get to Indianapolis. But Simon increases the lead to seven, make it up seven. Garces, despite that injury to his leg, still putting out out there. Sam God can't pull it out and take this much time. Clock's starting to become a major opponent here. Sam God gets a second try. Garces tips it in. We got an injured player down on the floor. Excellent piece of officiating here. Derek Brown. That tangled underneath. Looks like it's a knee. He's holding. He will have to come out. The basket will count. 83-78, but put back by Garces. Brings him within five, and again with Crozier already out. Then Murdoch would have to be the sub into the ball game, would you think? It's the only one left. They already have right on the floor, and they really only play the seven. Well, we've got, so let's check that. Kofi Pointer comes in for the first time in Birmingham. He didn't play on Friday night. Well, Brown is running it off. He does have to come out of the ball game. He can be put right back in after action is played, but he is uh, jogging okay. So a 6'8 freshman from Baltimore, number four, Kofi Pointer is in. Terry blitzing by Shamgod. Smart play by Terry. He knew Shamgod was coming from behind, so he changed direction. already back at the scorer's table ready to check in on the next whistle. 15 on the shot clock. Dickerson really coming to the ball well. Realizing Pointer's a new guy into the game, so he wants it in his hands. Five seconds. Big defensive hold here by Providence. Four seconds. Simon. And Providence is still in it. A dangerous dribble. Thomas pulls up to prevent the charge. And Shamgod reaches in. Bibby will shoot two. Four on Shamgod. Give Thomas a lot of credit. He was weaving through traffic. He is just so tired. Now, that young man was a center in high school. Played with Stephen Marbury. There's Thomas, but he put that ball on the floor trying to impersonate his former teammate. That shot had a drop, would have brought it to three. Bibby to shoot two. Now these fouls almost as big as the Kansas fouls. Lute Olsen finding that nothing comes easy. Yeah, yeah. Think of all those free throws shot off the technicals. 
Arizona has attempted 14 more, make it 15 more free throws than Providence in this game. Sham God's going to put it on the floor, try to go right by again to draw that foul. Here he comes. And he gets it. Well, then one player, Bibby, hit the floor trying to get the charge to end Sham God's game for the day. You almost wonder at this time, maybe they go boxing one on him to try to get some help because he just, he takes anybody that's guarding him one-on-one, -on -one, just goes by. He showed this on Friday and doing it in here as well. Number 12, John Sham God is alive. Six of six today, with a minute five remaining. Pete Gillen in trouble as far as timeouts, Jim. He doesn't have an opportunity to do anything in that regard, but he can foul and he can press the rest of the way. Again, no timeouts for Providence. Down. Six, and Brown could bring it to four. He'll go to the line for two. And if you're Lute Olsen, you'd almost rather him get the putback as opposed to the foul to keep the clock moving here. Foul number 21, Bennett Davison. That is third. Davison number three. Brown and Thomas have not really had Harry big Brown days offensively, but they've been out there a long time, and they're both very tired. Brown, who had 33 in the upset of Duke. This Providence team that took out the two seed in this region, Arizona, ending the hopes for the one seed, Kansas. And we talked about his travels from East Coast to West Coast. He's the only player ever to have his number retired at City College LA, JC. Four-point game, minute two remaining. Those of you expecting to see D 60 Davidson's minutes up. coming up, just a few minutes. One minute remaining. One minute. Dickerson pulls up. Wow, that's not what you want to do. You want to use clock, exactly. And sensing it, right misses the land. Carson pulls it away. That should be goaltending, by the way. There is a foul call. That ball looked like it might have been over the cylinder. Hold on, will they call it goaltending? I don't think so. The trail official didn't didn't stay with that, Jim. You'll see it right here. Garces goes up, steals it. Davison's going to go up here. No, that was a good block. Yep. Hit the front of the rim. Yep. And still on the way up. But you've got the clock stop. you got Garces, who is not a good free throw shooter on the line. Just shooting 41%. And he'll have two. 47 seconds. Why did Dickerson take the jumper, Jim? Don't need it. Nope. He would only put him up six, and it would still be a two-possession game. Certainly. Certainly. You've got to think arithmetic when you get down the wall. Wow. Yeah, that, went, that one That one brought rain. Came back from the rafters. And a timeout called by Arizona. Our score is the exact same score by which Arizona won on Friday night, knocking out Kansas. But here it's not over. We'll be right back. Final team headed to Indianapolis. One more free throw for Garces. Let's remember the Providence is out of timeouts. Arizona has one full remaining, and the arrow belongs to the Friars. Jim, let's go back to those technical fouls. How big are they now? Huge. Not only the foul shots, but getting the ball back out of bounds to score again. You've got to keep your composure when you play the game. You see this wild adventure. All right, Garces way in the air. It's good to be rebounded. And comes away. To Thomas. Garces again. Missed the lay-in. And last touch by Providence. They had two great tries inside. I think Garces anticipated a little more body being put on him, and he put it up so hard. But, boy, not by a lack of effort. How about how many times has Garces today just ripped the rebound out of someone else's arms? Bibby, Simon, get it back to Bibby. That's, they're really reluctant to put the ball in Bibby's hands. That's where it needs to be. 26 seconds. Simon shot. Why? Why? Why is he taking it? 
Big mistake by Arizona. Put the ball in Vivi's hands and let him finish the game. This could tie it. Yeah! Jamel Thomas. Oh, and a Providence steal. Sham God has it. Providence can win the game. Sham God. Kansas got fouled. Off the fingertips of Arizona with 3.9 remaining. No timeouts to set up a play. is going to take a time, but Jim, Arizona making a huge mistake on two shots. In addition to that, why not the ball in Vinny's hand? We'll be right back. Time out in Birmingham. They were three down. Wright got the ball to Thomas, who stepped back, knocked down the three. And then after another steal, the ball went out of bounds. They say last touch by Davison. So Providence ball, 3.9 remaining. Jim, I got a question. Why would you call a timeout and give Providence, who didn't have any timeouts left, an opportunity to set up the last second play? They go along, right? Five foot eight can win it. Three pointer wide of the mark. Okay. And overtime in Birmingham. for five more minutes for the final spot at the final four. Well, they got the timeout thanks to Arizona to set one up, and they ended up getting it to right for a three. Is that what you want? No, not at all. You're talking about a 21% shooter from the outside from the three-point range. That is not the play that Providence wanted, and both teams have broken down here in terms of strategy. Arizona, by taking shots that they never should have taken, one in the part of Dickerson, one in the part of Simon and Terry as well. Both teams winless in overtime games this season. Arizona 0-2, Providence 0-3, and what's really startling about Providence is 0-3. They were outscored in the uh, overtime games 56-23. to I mean, they've been blown out in those three overtime losses. Remember that they do not have Crozier to put in the ball game. He's out of there. They were 10 down with 3.38 remaining, 82-72, and without timeouts. Well, Jim, you started the show talking about the slipper. <laughs> it's going to fit someone's foot. And what Providence a... takes the lead in overtime on the foot back by Brown. This is a team that's not normally a good offensive rebounding team, but you can see now that they're packing it back in. Thomas, Brown, and Garces can really get up and hammer the boards. Bramlett's out of the game, so that hurts Arizona in that regard. Bibby. Big, big mistake by Arizona not having the ball in his hands but at you'll, the end of regulation. If they lose this game, they'll still be at, answering questions next year about why they kept coming down and putting up shots yep. with the lead in the last minute. Nice pump fake. Thomas, Simon had an arm in the face. Good defense. Right saved it, but right to the arms of Bibby ahead, Terry. Arizona in front. Now you see both Thomas and Brown and Garces walking down the floor. That's how tired they are. And Dickerson has been the man on Sham God. Sham God, three. Garces again puts it back up and in. What a monster game he's having. 16 points, 17 rebounds. 89 all. Three minutes to go in the overtime. There's Dickerson trying to post right up down inside. Right just staying with him. Simon, tough shot, banks it in. We're seeing some great competitors out here today. Simon, as I said before, not a great shooter, but a great scorer. Such a tough kid. Those of you expecting 60 minutes, stay tuned. It'll be coming up after this regional final. Providence and Arizona looking for the Cinderella roll at Indianapolis. And Dickerson has fouled out for Arizona. 
They have Harris to come in for Dickerson, but now that changes the matchup. Probably puts Terry on Shamgod because Dickerson was guarding him before. Lou Olson wants them all down there. And takes his, is he going to take the timeout? Well, timeout called. And we're waiting for the signal. Kentucky, Minnesota slated to go in one national semifinal. And North Carolina against the winner of this game in the other from Indianapolis. This is the sixth overtime game of the tournament.